Election Headquarters in New York. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Charles Corralt in the CBS Newsroom, Bernard Kalb in San Clemente, Bob Schieffer in Mitchell, South Dakota, Barry Serafin in Towson, Maryland, Terry Drinkwater in Rockville, Maryland, Jeff Williams in Ayrshire, Iowa, Jed Duval in Cheyenne, Wyoming, Richard Threlkeld in Prineville, Oregon, Bruce Dunning in Cat Lai, South Vietnam, and Bruce Hall in Miami. Good evening. This was the day that comes every four years when the people of the United States choose one man to wield the greatest power given to any world leader. And it appears at this hour that they turned out in record numbers to choose today the next president of the United States. Despite rain over much of the nation, state after state reported long lines at the polls, some places so long that voting hours were being extended. The report seemed to put into doubt early on this election day at least one prediction of pollsters and pundits that there was widespread apathy over this year's election. Both Republican and Democratic leaders saw in these large turnouts hopes for their side. Republican National Chairman Robert Dole said that traditionally Republican areas of New Jersey and Connecticut were voting particularly heavily. Senate McGovernor, uh, Senator McGovern's chief advisors noted a very heavy vote in Democratic areas, particularly black, blue collar, and student precincts. Just a scattering of precincts have been counted at this point, but the figures are President Nixon, 218,000 votes. Senator McGovern, 115,000. That would be 65% for the president and 34% for Senator McGovern, and that's with less than 1% of the nation's precincts counted. But CBS News can estimate now, on the basis of its vote profile analysis, that in Kentucky, where enough of our sample precincts now have been counted, will go to uh, President Nixon. His vote will be about 61% of the total when all the votes have been counted, we estimate, to McGovern's 39%. The first vote to fall to the first state to fall to President Nixon in this election night. We'll be back in a minute with more on the election story. A correction on our estimate on the uh, final vote in Kentucky, where we say that President Nixon will win, the figure will be 65% for President Nixon and 35 for George McGovern is the way we calculate it here. President and Mrs. Nixon were the first voters to appear this morning at the Concordia Elementary School precinct in San Clemente, California. And then they took a plane back to Washington to await the outcome. Bernard Cow reports. Some of the local people here at San Clemente turned out early this morning to see a couple of their neighbors vote. The first to vote at Concordia School, Mr. and Mrs. Richard Nixon of San Clemente and the White House. The president projecting an image of relaxed self-confidence as he makes his own personal contribution to the Republican slogan of four more years. They use a paper ballot here, the ballot the size of a newspaper. There are a lot of choices to be made. Among other things, 22 referenda in California, including everything from decriminalizing marijuana to controls on pornography. There's also the choice of a congressman and the choice of a president. It took Mrs. Nixon about three minutes to check off her decisions. At one point, the president, perhaps because of the unwieldiness of the big ballot, dropped it, the kind of event that is destined to be a footnote to the history written today. By the way, it took the president more than five minutes to check off his selections. A couple of presidential votes here, his and Mrs. Nixon's, about which there is no mystery. Bernard Kiaub, CBS News, at Concordia School, San Clemente. George McGovern was in a philosophical mood as his 22-month-long campaign ended. He said, We've done our best, we've waged an honest campaign, we've worked as hard as our physical capacities would permit, now it's up to the people. Bob Schieffer reports. McGovern had only a few hours sleep at best after a long day and night of campaigning, but he appeared rested this morning as he came to a Mitchell, South Dakota church to vote. Bannering with photographers, he said that as a matter of good judgment, he was voting the straight Democratic ticket. There was little doubt as to how he marked his ballot, with at least 50 reporters and photographers in, around, and on top of the voting booth. It was perhaps the most photographed secret ballot in recent history. McGovern predicted victory to the last. In a short speech at nearby Dakota Wesleyan, where he once taught, 
He talked about the memories of the campaign and the people along the way. And as we would walk up and down those long rows of people who met us at a thousand different airports uh, across this country and along the platforms and the crossroads and the great cities of this nation, frequently uh, people would say things to me that weren't always uh, heard uh, by the press. Sometimes I said things that I wish weren't heard uh, by the uh, uh, press. But what would, uh, what would come uh, to me uh, from these uh, people along the way that we met uh, were their expressions of hope. And that hope, McGovern said, was to be a better nation than before. There has been a certain serenity about McGovern lately. He feels he has done his best, but he thinks this will be his last try if he loses. Bob Schieffer, CBS News, Mitchell, South Dakota. Vice President Agnew spent a quiet election day in his office in Washington. He broke it long enough to end his active role in this campaign in a voting booth in a Baltimore suburb. Barry Serafin reports. Vice President and Mrs. Agnew voted at an elementary school in Towson, Maryland. Agnew joked with newsmen before entering the voting booth. If I don't come out of half an hour, send for him. <laughs> to no one's surprise, it did not take Agnew long to complete his voting. One minute, 55 seconds. Outside, he was asked what kind of victory tonight he would find satisfactory. I don't make any predictions. I'm out of the predicting business. We'll just wait and see how things work out. What would be satisfying to you? A win. Any kind of Any kind of win would be very satisfying. Looking back at the campaign, Mr. Agnew, what do you think was Well, no, I think, I don't think you can uh, categorize that on a basis of uh, what's this, the, the same issue controlling countrywide. I think different things, different issues affected different areas, and uh, certainly uh, uh, the idea that uh, McGovern uh, was criticizing the foreign policy of the country, which has never been done, I think hurt him very badly. Agnew left to visit his aunt a few blocks away, then returned to Washington, where he will join fellow Republicans tonight for what he expects to be a victory celebration. Barry Serafin, CBS News, Towson, Maryland. McGovern running mate Sergeant Shriver, who was the last of the major candidates to return from the campaign trail, also was the last to make it to the polls. Terry Drinkwater reports from a Maryland suburb of Washington. Sergeant Schreiber went to vote in mid-afternoon. He slept late because his campaign jet didn't return from Texas to Washington until just before dawn this morning. Working to the end for the ticket, there was a little final campaigning at the polls. Schreiber trying to change a mind or two. Then, a delay for those who wanted autographs. On the way to the booth, a Republican worker handed Schreiber a sample GOP ballot. He and his wife, Eunice Kennedy Schreiber, already had sample Democratic ballots. No question about which list of recommended candidates the Shrivers follow. The vice presidential candidate himself took a minute and seven seconds to pull all of the levers. Shriver's four sons came along to watch and received a brief civics lesson from their father. They've been along on much of the whole campaign. Shriver said it felt good to be voting for himself. It's the first time that he has ever run for political office and had his name on a ballot. Shriver will watch the returns here at his estate. Then he'll talk to McGovern and finally to the Democratic Headquarters Hotel in downtown Washington for a statement. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Rockville, Maryland. Politicians long have looked to certain areas as the bellwethers of how an election is going. These areas range in size from wards to states. However, throughout history, there have been three counties which always have voted with the winner. Jeff Williams, Jed Duvall, and Richard Threlkeld have reports on those counties. First Williams in Palo Alto County, Iowa. In November of 1896, most of the people in this town of Ayrshire voted for William McKinley. And in the 76 years since then, they have unfailingly picked the right man for president. George McGovern has some support in this town. The people are mostly farmers and predominantly Democrats. Even so, Nixon is considered a favorite. However, the president does not have an overwhelming lead here, as polls show him having nationwide. Nixon gets considerable organizational support from Mayor Jody Smith. At age 20, Smith is the country's youngest mayor. A firm Republican, Smith seconded Nixon's nomination in Miami. He predicts Nixon will carry the township by about 60%. 
The farmers are aware of the Watergate affair, but few hold it against Nixon. They write that off as politics. Some are more concerned about Nixon's peace efforts. On one hand, they ask why wasn't it done four years ago. On the other hand, they now ask if peace terms will really be agreed upon. The men don't like to say publicly who they'll vote for, but no one predicts an upset or a break in the town streak of choosing the presidential winner. Jeff Williams, CBS News, Ayrshire, Iowa. This is Cheyenne fashion, this year and every year. Even feet that never slide into stirrups are clad in boots. The railroad built this town. It came west with the expansion of the late 1800s, was here when Wyoming was merely a territory. In 1896, Laramie County went from McKinley. Every four years since, it chose the same man the nation did. The place is anything but burning with political fever, few bumper stickers or billboards, and not everyone wants to talk about it. Nevertheless, there is interest. Voter registration is up to 30,000, a record. A recent University of Wyoming poll gave Nixon a two-to-one edge, and then some. Why Laramie County has always been on the winning side of the presidential votes is a matter of opinion. One official here says it's because the population is mobile and diverse. Some folks say it's a matter of chance, and more than one will grin at you and say, superior judgment. Jed Duval, CBS News, Laramie County, Wyoming. Crook County, Oregon, population 10,000, makes its living off its cattle and its trees. Either by luck or some kind of electoral sensory perception, Crook County is voted for the winner in every presidential race since Grover Cleveland back in 1884. And although Democrats outnumber Republicans two to one here, Crook County will probably vote this year for Richard Nixon two to one. And with good reason, Lately, the lumber business and the cattle business have been bullish, to say the least. But few voters are all that charmed by the Republican ticket. A lot of them we talked to would have voted for George Wallace if he'd been a candidate. In fact, presidential politics don't even come up in conversation very much. Over at Brownfield's restaurant, the voters are more interested in the jukebox, or hunting deer, or if it comes to politics, the hot race for county commissioner. So for whatever it's worth, looks like Crook County is going to go Nixon by a landslide. And if you want to believe what the pollsters and pundits are saying, looks like Crook County voters will keep their record intact. Richard Threlkeld, CBS News, Prineville, Oregon. President Nixon's so-called Southern strategy four years ago was hampered by the candidacy of George Wallace, who won five states of the Deep South. With Wallace out of the running this year, a key question is where his supporters will go, to American Party candidate John Schmitz or to the president, perhaps. Roger Mudd, you're covering the South, and wonder how it looks to you at this moment. Walter, virtually every Wallace voter in Kentucky, which is the state we have our uh, fullest returns on, virtually every Wallace voter in 1968 tonight is voting for Richard Nixon. Uh, it indicates that uh, from Tennessee, the same pattern is holding. McGovern tonight is running about uh, two or three percentage points behind Hubert Humphrey's mark in 1968. Tonight, uh, the difference is the George Wallace vote from 68. We can take a look at our Kentucky uh, vote profile analysis board there. As uh, Walter has reported, the uh, ultimate returns show that President Nixon is the winner 65% uh, to 35% for Senator McGovern. Our uh, popular vote shows uh, now Richard Nixon running a little less than 2 to 1 ahead of uh, Senator McGovern. 38% of the vote in. The bulk of that early was from Louisville, Jefferson County in the 3rd District, which is heavy Democratic uh, uh, voting pattern there, but now it's beginning to move toward the West in Paducah. But take a look at the Kentucky Senate board and you'll get an example of how much ticket splitting is going on tonight. This does not indicate that President Nixon will pull in with him all the Republican uh, uh, job seekers. Louis Nunn, the former Republican governor, trailing by about 200 votes. Walter D. Huddleston, the Democrat. In the uh, Tennessee presidential race, with 11% of the vote in, Richard Nixon leading George McGovern uh, better than three to one. That is vote, voting from East Tennessee, heavily Republican. Ticket split also in Tennessee in the senatorial race. There, the Republican incumbent, Howard Baker, leading uh, redistricted Democratic Congressman Ray Blanton by about 10,000 votes, demonstrating again, Walter, 
that uh, tonight, uh, in the South at least, not everybody is voting a straight Republican ticket. Mike Wallace, how are things shaping up in the East? Walter, the uh, predicted voter apathy is surely not the story in the East tonight, all along the Eastern Seaboard, from Maine on down to Maryland, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York City, Baltimore City. Voters are going to the polls in huge numbers. In some areas, they say that records are being set. But we don't know yet what it means, because there are not enough returns in on our boards yet to tell us. Most of the polls in the eastern states don't close until 8 o'clock. Could be that voters are turning out to give the president the mandate that he asked for. It could be that the McGovern organization is turning out huge numbers of voters they promised that they'd bring to the polls today. We'll be able to tell you more about it in about an hour and a half. Dan Rather, I think you're starting to get a trickle of returns from the Midwest. Well, we are, Walter, and the story in the Midwest at the moment uh, is in Indiana, where it appears that President Nixon is getting most of the old Wallace vote in that state. In Indiana, 7% of the precincts reporting the actual tabulated vote shows President Nixon running uh, somewhat less than 2 to 1 ahead of George McGovern. However, on the basis of our own sample precincts, the president uh, may win on the order of 67% of the Indiana vote. Now, we give him a significant lead. We're not prepared to say just yet that President Nixon will carry Indiana margin in the state turns out to be anywhere near 67 percent, he may bring in a Republican governor in that state with him. There's a governorship open in Indiana, and on the basis of the precincts reporting thus far, the tabulated vote shows the Republican out to an early lead, and on the basis of our own CBS News sample precincts, the indication is that the Republican candidate for governor in Indiana may wind up winning uh, with about 59 percent of the vote. The results so far from a CBS News Election Day survey of almost 7,500 voters interviewed as they left the polls across the nation indicates that the anticipated landslide for President Richard Nixon appears to be taking place. CBS News has tabulated its results up to the middle of the voting day for each of the 143 polling places in which the voters were interviewed even taking into account sampling errors and possible changes in voting patterns during the latter part of the day, the findings tend to confirm predictions of a Republican landslide. The survey, in which voters are asked to fill out a secret ballot designating their choices and other information, is primarily designed to analyze voting behavior by various population and demographic groups. Uh, we'll be presenting those findings as the evening progresses. As usual, there are procedural voting foul-ups today, troubles with voting machines and that sort of thing. As a result, there have been court orders extending the balloting time by three hours in Butler County, Ohio, Hudson County, New Jersey, and perhaps some other places that we haven't even heard about yet. Here in our election headquarters, we now have about... 1% of the national vote counted, and President Nixon has jumped out into an early and a long lead. 66% of the vote goes to him so far, 50, 546,000 to 272,000 for Senator George McGovern. That's, as we said, is a 66 to 33% lead, a, uh, a 2 to 1 margin for the president with 1% of the nation's precincts counted. John Smith's the American Independent Party candidate. That was the party on whose ballot George Wallace appeared in 1968. Well, he's got almost 10,000 votes and about 1% of the vote. CBS News is able to say on the basis of our sample precincts that uh, President Nixon uh, definitely will win in Kentucky and in Indiana, in Kentucky by a 65 to 35 percent margin, in Indiana by an even larger margin, 67 to 33. And that's the way it is up to now, Tuesday, November 7th, 1972. We'll be back at our election headquarters for our continuing coverage in a very few moments. CBS News coverage of Election 72. Tonight, the latest returns. This broadcast is sponsored by the Ford Motor Company and 6,283 Ford and Lincoln Mercury dealers. The goal, no unhappy owners. Reporting from CBS News Election Headquarters in New York, here is correspondent Walter Cronkite. 
Good evening from CBS News election headquarters. Uh, some or all of the polls have closed now in a dozen states, and the early returns put President Nixon, as expected, out in front and by a sizable margin. His early returns, far too few to be significant, however, nevertheless conform to all of the indicators and all of the polls. Let's take a look at that popular vote with about 1% of the precincts counted. President Nixon has 570,000 votes, and George McGovern, 283,000. That's a two-to-one margin for President Nixon. And CBS News is able to say on the basis of our sample precincts that the president definitely uh, has won Kentucky and Indiana. Kentucky by a 65 to 35 margin. Indiana by an even larger one, 67 to 33. Also, in Indiana, our CBS News estimate is that the Republican candidate for the uh, governorship will win there. He is Mr. Bowen, and he uh, has beaten uh, the former governor, Mr. Welsh. On the electoral vote, President Nixon now has 22 electoral votes from Kentucky and Indiana. He's leading in states with 35 more electoral votes, and that would give him a 57 toward that 270 he needs for re-election. The uh, total vote coming in tonight indicates a very heavy turnout across the entire United States, uh, much heavier than anyone had anticipated when the, uh, the newsmen, and the pundits, and the pollsters out across the countryside said they were finding apathy along uh, among the many states. Reports of the heavy turnout indicate that that vote could very well go above 80 million, and that would be a record. It would have to go above 88 million to be a record in percentage above uh, the previous record established in 1968. CBS News can now say that President Nixon is also a winner in Tennessee. Uh, since most of the state, including the heavily Democratic cities, have not yet reported, the current estimate, though, of 72 percent for Nixon probably is going to drop somewhat as the polls close in the rest of the state. But uh, at the, when all the numbers are in, President Nixon will add Tennessee to his uh, total vote. Across the country, the Nixon landslide seems to be developing about as predicted. But of course, there are a lot of other races to be watched here tonight. And how broad and how long will President uh, Nixon's coattails be? Will he carry into office a, a new House of Representatives and a new Senate, Republican for only the third time in the last 40 years? There are 33 Senate seats up this year. All 435 members of the House, of course, are up. 18 governorships are up, too. Besides that, thousands upon thousands of local races for everything from uh, mayor to a dog catcher and state offices, of course, as well, and a lot of propositions on the ballot, a lot of uh, uh, referendum-type uh, uh, questions being asked. In Colorado, for instance, uh, will the Olympics, the Winter Olympics, be held there in 1976? Marijuana legalization is on the ballot in California, abortion in Michigan. That sort of question all across these United States. So there's a lot of reason yet to get out uh, to a vote, uh, whether the presidential race seems to be swinging one side of the one way or the other. Let's take a look now at all those races around the uh, United States. We have Mike Wallace reporting from the east, Roger Mudd from the south, Dan Rather from the Midwest, John Hart from the West, and Eric Severide to analyze the whys and the hows of this uh, big election night. Since most of those early poll closings have come in the South, we'll hear first from Roger. Roger? Well, the solid South uh, used to be solid. Last time it was solid Democratic was 1944, and since then it's broken apart. But tonight, just looking at our regional map, you can see the building blocks already are going into place for a solid Republican South. Already we have a presidential winner in Kentucky and Tennessee, and uh, early indications are from every poll and every pre-voting sounding that the president would sweep the South, perhaps uh, doing not as well in, in Texas. But tonight already he has picked up two states, Kentucky and Tennessee. The Tennessee presidential race, our vote profile analysis shows that uh, the ultimate count there will be 72-28. That is, uh, as Walter pointed out, uh, basically a, an Eastern Republican uh, vote that uh, percentage may drop. In the popular vote in Tennessee, with 14% of the vote in, the president is leading uh, better than two to one. But take a look at the uh, uh, Kentucky presidential race. You'll also see there in uh, our vote profile analysis a 65-35 split over Senator McGovern. 
in the popular vote in Kentucky with 50% uh, of the vote in he's leading uh, easily two to one there in the Kentucky senatorial race however Walter D Huddleston still maintaining just a razor thin edge over the former Republican governor Louis Nunn that's a Republican Senate seat being vacated by John Sherman Cooper and if the Republicans intend to take over control of the Senate they cannot afford to lose any seats they now have that is one of them and in the uh, Tennessee senatorial race there is evidence tonight of ticket splitting not as much as in Kentucky the incumbent Republican Howard Baker with 51,000 and Re uh, Democratic Congressman Ray Blanton 38,000 so that race uh, looks favorable for Howard Baker busing was an issue there but uh, all indications are that Senator Baker has been able to overcome the charges by Ray Blanton that he uh, was responsible for the appointment of a federal judge who ordered busing around Nashville so Walter uh, we're off this evening already with uh, two states in the south and I dare say as uh, we look at that map through the evening that dark uh, Kentucky Tennessee block will spread all the way to the Gulf CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment Our CBS News estimate uh, has been able to uh, say that Indiana has fallen definitely into its uh, normal Republican habits tonight, and uh, Dan Rather from the Midwest has the story. Walter, as you know, Indiana is considered the most southern of the Midwestern states, one time bastion of the Ku Klux Klan and a traditionally Republican state. No surprise that uh, CBS News estimates that President Nixon has carried Indiana. Uh, there may be a mild surprise, though, in the length of the president's coattails. The CBS, uh, first of all, the figures in the presidential race, uh, the CBS News estimate is that the president's final margin in Indiana may be on the order of 67%. Now, let's take a look at the figures in the Indiana governor's race, which was expected to be very close, with 12% of the precincts reporting. Uh, this is the president's uh, margin over George McGovern, but since uh, our CBS News estimate is that uh, the president's winning margin will be on the order of 67%, those figures don't mean a great deal, except they do reinforce the idea that the Nixon sweep is running very deep in Indiana. Now, for a look at that governor's race. The Indiana governor's race uh, was expected to be extremely close. It's an open governor's race. Uh, Matthew Welch, a former governor, the Democrat, who in the face of a President Nixon uh, carrying Indiana in 1960, Welch, the Democrat, won the Indiana governorship. However, this year, in an attempt to come back, not to, for a consecutive term, but to come back, our CBS News estimate is that the Republican, Otis Bowen, a physician and the uh, majority leader of the Indiana House, has uh, won the Indiana gubernatorial race, and his final margin will be on the order of 59%. Now, to translate that into coattail terms as to what it may mean for the rest of the evening, it now appears that at least one and perhaps more uh, Democratic House members in Indiana may be in some trouble. For example, in the 11th District, incumbent Democrat Andrew Jacobs, with 16% of the vote in and counted, trails by about uh, 62 to 38% behind William Hudnut, the Republican challenger. It appears that in Indiana, the president's coattails may indeed be long, and there may be one or more Democratic House seats change hands, change parties in Indiana. And to note that has no according to this news estimate, the polls closed in Ohio less than an hour ago, but on the basis of our sample precincts, CBS News estimates that President Nixon has carried Ohio with about 60% of the vote. Now again, that is a larger margin than the McGovern people uh, had expected even when they were willing to talk about uh, defeat, and it may also mean in Ohio, we'll see as the evening goes along that some Democratic House members could be in trouble in Ohio as well. Walter? That uh, total now is four states for President Nixon, according to our CBS News estimate, Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, and Ohio. That gives him a total of some 57 electoral votes, uh, and uh, uh, that is on the way toward the 270 he needs for re-election. All of those uh, totals, over 60%, including, as Dan pointed out, Ohio, which was a state where Senator McGovern had campaigned hard and long and had hoped to uh, do very well, perhaps uh, even uh, have a chance to win. If that uh, sort of figure continues across the country, it would indicate that the landslide uh, that had been predicted uh, will develop for President Nixon. 
a landslide perhaps of historic proportions uh, to be uh, the largest landslide in our modern history. You'd have to get better than 61% of the vote to beat uh, President uh, Johnson's 1964 victory over Senator Goldwater. And he has to uh, get uh, uh, all of the electoral vote, votes, uh, save eight. Uh, that was the uh, record in 1936 of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt over Alf Landon, when uh, Landon won just Maine and Vermont. Now let's take a look at the East with Mike Wallace. Yeah, well, there's not too much still water to take a look at in the east because uh, in spite of the fact that up and down the eastern seaboard the turnout has been heavy, polls don't close in most eastern states till 8 o'clock, New York votes until 9. So returns are sketchy in the extreme, but some precincts are reporting from Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Let's take a look at these. In Maine, as you can see, it's about 2 to 1 for the president over George McGovern. That's about as expected, but let's go on down to the senatorial race in Maine, if we may. Mrs. Margaret Chase Smith, who is 74 years old and running for her fifth term, may be in for some trouble tonight from her Democratic challenger, Congressman William Hathaway, who is 48 and has made age, Mrs. Smith's age, an issue in this campaign. That and her aloofness from the main scene, as a matter of fact, uh, Mrs. Smith was said to be slightly miffed because the newspaper, the weekly newspaper for which she used to work back in Maine, uh, came out with an editorial against Senator Margaret Chase's fifth term. They said it was time for a change. Bill Hathaway had expected when he announced his candidacy that he was going to be running on the coattails of Ed Muskie, who at that time was going to be the presidential candidate, he thought. When the Muskie candidacy went down in the primaries, so did Bill Hathaway's, it was thought, but it's conceivable Late polls show that uh, Senator Smith and Bill Hathaway are running about neck and neck, have been in the polls in the state of Maine. Let's move over to New Hampshire, where 2% of the precincts are reporting. As you can see, the president is leading by about 2 to 1 in that state, too. There is a tough race for Senate in New Hampshire. Senator Thomas McIntyre, the Democrat incumbent, running for his second term, leading uh, uh, Wesley Powell, two-term governor of the state of New Hampshire, but just barely at this moment, Powell backed by William Loeb, the publisher of the Manchester Union Leader. Powell doesn't like Richard Nixon, and Richard Nixon reciprocates the feeling. Uh, Mr. Powell called uh, the president's trip to China a kind of sellout, although he changed his, uh, changed his point of view uh, about two or three weeks ago when uh, Vice President Agnew showed up in New Hampshire. That's going to be a tough race. For a gubernatorial race with 2% of the precincts reporting in New Hampshire, we see a fellow by the name of Malcolm McLean leading, leading Meldrum Thompson, the Republican candidate. Thompson's a conservative. Roger Crowley is a conservative. Thompson is supposed to be the leader. Malcolm McLean has 98 votes. We're told that they all come from Waterville Valley, the center of ski territory in New Hampshire. And, uh, Malcolm McLean, the mayor of Concord, New Hampshire, is chairman of the U.S. Olympic Ski uh, a Committee, and those votes are ski enthusiast votes. Finally, in Vermont, Mr. Nixon leading by about three to one, with one percent of the votes counted in Vermont. And in the Vermont gubernatorial race, Luther Hackett, the Republican replacement for Governor Dean Davis, who has retired from office, leading Thomas Salmon the Democratic challenger. Sketchy returns, as you can see, Walter, from the east still. Popular return now gives President Nixon 773,000 votes, George McGovern 367,000. Uh, the percentage lead for President Nixon now with 2% of the nation's precincts counted as widened. 67% to 32 as the landslide seems to be developing as predicted. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. Yeah, what program? President Nixon at this early uh, stage in the evening already, uh, according to our CBS News estimate, has picked up the states of Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, and Ohio. He's leading in uh, most of the other states in which just a few scattered returns have come in. So far, he has won 57 of the 270 electoral votes needed for re-election. And it does appear, and doesn't it, Eric, that the that the landslide is on. Yes, it's, uh, well, I guess I'll be surprised around this table, Walter. It's been a most odd campaign and, and election. 
Here you have a not terribly popular leader of the minority party piling up what all these early returns suggest will be a huge majority in the country. And in this campaign, we've had the incumbent uh, on the offensive. We've had the challenger on the defensive. That's all very untraditional. But some are all, all very unexciting, too. In any lopsided situation like this, of course, the opinion polls that take, take all the suspense out of, the, out of American elections. They just lie like a heavy smog over all conversations and calculations. A close finish tonight, if any miracle like that happened, uh, would do a lot to restore a little more uh, uh, innocent faith in the unpredictability of the ordinary and independent American citizen. Anyway, it might cut the pollsters down to human size a little more. A landslide victory, I suppose, is anything with about 56% of the popular vote on up. That's as good a figure to pick out of the air as any. There have been 10 landslide victories since the Civil War. In nearly all of them, the uh, winning presidential candidate has brought in uh, shoals and coveys of party senators, representatives, and governors, but maybe not tonight. And it's the Senate races that uh, bear the watching. Mr. Nixon will be very pleased with a numerical majority in the Senate. They haven't had that, Republicans, for about 18 years. But he'll settle for that ideological majority he claimed he got two years ago, but didn't quite get. The House has not given Mr. Nixon too much trouble. And he's almost got an ideological majority on the Supreme Court already. If you get that in the Senate tonight, then there's going to be a great deal less checking and balancing of presidential power. It was the Senate, after all, that voted to cut off funds for Vietnam by a two-vote margin, right. and that prevented the removal of busing cases from the courts by a one-vote margin. And the South seems to be the key to the Senate result, highly radioactive. And a loose coalition of moderates, that's what we've had running the Senate, that could be replaced by a loose coalition of real conservatives, depending on tonight's results. It wouldn't mean automatic presidential control of legislation by any means, because senators are uh, strong-minded men. They're not easily pushed around. But it would mean a different tone and direction. And it would just about assure no big adventurous experiments in social legislation, at any rate, to come for quite a long time. I think it would mean a quiet and cautious period ahead. And that seems to be what the popular majority in the country wants in in any case. Thank you, Walter. John Hart uh, is covering the West for us, and uh, while we're not getting any results, of course, out there where the polls are still open and will be for quite a while yet, what should we be looking for in the West, John? Well, we're looking for some very fascinating propositions in California, Walter. As you indicated earlier, they're voting on marijuana, whether it will be legal to grow it, own it, carry it, but not to sell it. Colorado is also voting on some radical propositions, whether or not to reduce the income, that is, the property tax by 60%, and as much as double the most expensive taxes of the large corporations. The polls don't close in California, the state that George McGovern says he needs in order to have any chance of winning for another three and a half hours. But, Walter, we can report this news. Pine Valley, Utah, population 75, went for Richard Nixon 12 to 1. That moderates the importance of that news, because we have to tell you they usually do that. <laughs> well, the, well, the places that usually do that are certainly doing it across the country as we get these reports from uh, the smaller precincts and some of the more uh, unique names around the country, uh, and uh, also some of those that don't normally do it seem to be doing it this year. That is, going a Republican, at least on the presidential side. What we're going to be watching as the evening develops, of course, is the effect of that coattail vote. Uh, will the president carry with him uh, the, uh, the five extra Senate seats he needs to gain control of the Senate? That's assuming that Vice President Agnew will be there to vote any, uh, to cast any uh, deciding votes in a tie. Uh, six votes uh, for the Republicans, six additional seats would give them uh, undisputed control of the Senate. They need 39 seats uh, in addition to holding on to the ones they've got in order to win the House. Actually, uh, the, in uh, some one-third, better than a third of the elections over the last hundred years, 50 elections, 18 times, more than that number of seats have changed hands in the House, so the Republicans have a chance to do it. To sum up, the first indications we have tonight are that the pollsters are right. President Nixon appears headed toward an overwhelming re-election victory. Mr. Nixon so far is running far in front of uh, George McGovern, and they're adding to his margin by picking up most of George Wallace's 1968 vote. Fairly shortly now, if present trends continue, we'll start being able to gauge that coattail effect 
That is how many Republicans will Mr. Nixon be able to pull along with them into the Senate, the House, Governor's Mansion, and so forth. All of this lies ahead tonight. Right now, the latest from our local stations on races in your area. This is Walter Cron, guide at CBS News Election Headquarters. CBS News coverage of Elections 72. Tonight, the latest returns. This broadcast is sponsored by Payne, Weber, Jackson & Curtis. We help you know about investing. Reporting from CBS News Election Headquarters in New York, here is correspondent Walter Cronkite. Well, the polls have closed in some 10 states across the United States by now. 20% of the polling places are closed by state at any rate. And after the most expensive campaign in American political history, uh, it appears to have availed the Democrats, as far as the presidency goes at any rate, very, very little. The landslide seems to have developed uh, very early for President Nixon. We uh, have seven states, according to our CBS News estimate, uh, that uh, we can say definitely are in President Nixon's uh, camp tonight. Uh, and others, many others, are leaning that way. We have, in just the last few minutes, been able to estimate that President Nixon will win in Florida by some 66% of the vote there, that he uh, has won in Georgia. The exact figure we don't have as yet on our estimate. He will win in Alabama also, that figure to uh, come along. Before uh, these uh, three uh, decisions were made, we could uh, say also that he had won Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, Ohio. Uh, so with those seven states, President Nixon has 95 of the electoral votes needed toward that 270 magic figure, which puts him over the top for a re-election. The actual count of the popular vote so far, with about 3% of the nation's vote in, President Nixon has gone over the million figure, 1,125,000. That's 67% of the vote. George McGovern, 538,000, 32% of the vote. John Smith's the American Independent Party candidate, 18,000 votes, or about 1%. There are, as you also know, some uh, 11 other uh, minor parties that are on the ballots in various states, uh, everything from the Communist Party to the Universalist Party. Universalist Party is on the ballot in one state. Its platform is to make flying saucers more respectable, apparently, uh, and uh, those votes will be tabulated a little later on. A report from Nixon headquarters now at the Shoreham Hotel in Washington. Let's go to Dan Shore. Yes, well, you of the vote. That's in terms of what you know, but in terms of the rosy predictions here, there have been briefings in which Herbert Klein, the White House Communications Director, has said that he expects 48 states for President Nixon. Uh, the only ones he said were in doubt were Massachusetts and West Virginia. And Harry Dent, the White House Southern strategist, said no, West Virginia is going to be in, which makes 49. They attributed this to the uh, landslide, uh, to the whole um, uh, large turnout at the polls. They expect to have as many as 85 million votes, which is considerably better than the 73 million in 1968 and the 70.5 million in 1964. One interesting thing, Harry Dent says that he expects that after the election, several Southern senators and congressmen will switch their affiliation to the Republican Party so that if the Republicans don't pick up the necessary seats to organize Congress, they'll be able to do so by some switches. He wouldn't mention names. He denied there were any deals. Could be Senator Eastland, could be Senator Byrd of Virginia, now independent. But there appears to be something in the making about a switch of parties by some of the nominal Democrats in the South. With me is Michelle Clark, who is looking at the scene out here as they get ready for the victory celebration with President Nixon and Vice President Agnew. Michelle? Well, apparently the only uh the only plans here have always been for a victory celebration, though the point is just how large the victory is going to be. The bands have been playing here for an hour. They've talked that the president should arrive here sometime before midnight. Uh, his cabinet members, all of the, the people in the party are expected to be here. Um, there, are a lot of, there should be a lot of young people. There are, there are two kinds of bands. There's Pete Fountain, 
and then there's a rock band for the younger people. Uh, we'll wait and see right now. There's not much room for enthusiasm, except when the announcements are made. There's a big screen over our shoulders that show all of the networks telling you exactly what we're projecting, and there's a cheer that goes up, of course, every time there's something said about a big flying slide victory here. And that's all we've got from here now. Walter? Now for the scene of McGovern headquarters, a sort of Bruce Morton at the Coliseum in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Bruce? for election night, and uh, once they volunteered to do all the artwork, why a couple of local families have volunteered to put them up. The way the returns have been going, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's not a rainbow, maybe it's a sunset, but uh, that be as it may. Uh, this place is very empty, as you can see. The reason is not that Senator McGovern lacks friends in South Dakota. He has lots of them. The reason is that uh, the Secret Service, uh, until just a few minutes ago, had been sweeping the Coliseum here. Uh, uh, not that they'd had any warnings, but simply the standard kind of security check that they do any time uh, the candidate goes somewhere. Uh, that process just ended a few minutes ago. Senator McGovern himself, uh, as you know, went to Mitchell, South Dakota, to vote today. Uh, stopped by on the way back at a family-owned shoe store in Mitchell and bought himself two pairs of shoes, uh, some black loafers and a pair of boots, the first boots he said he'd ever owned. Uh, it's not any kind of an election day tradition. One of the owners of the store said uh, they just seem to know McGovern's size, and uh, quite often when he's in Mitchell, he stops by and does a little business there. We drove back from there uh, here to Sioux Falls. It's just under a 70-mile drive. McGovern went to one more reception here, which makes him uh, an unusually active candidate for an election day, and uh, then went from there for some quiet time in the hotel where he's staying. Uh, he doesn't have a house here in Sioux Falls, just a small apartment over his office in Mitchell. Uh, he's having dinner, we're told, watching three television sets, uh, impartially, one to each network. And uh, just in the far corner of this room, uh, past the stage there, there's a little holding room with some more television sets, a couch or two, some easy chairs. Uh, that's uh, where he'll be coming eventually to wait and uh, get a final look at the returns before he comes out and talks to his supporters here. We are told that is not likely to happen anytime very early. Uh, uh, not that McGovern uh, doesn't believe in projections, but he wants to wait and uh, let the raw vote uh, pile up for a while before he does anything. There'll be some music here later on. It's very quiet now. Walter? Bruce, we were uh, told earlier that uh, in that Mr. Berg shoe store uh, where he bought those two pairs of shoes, he was extended credit. I gather he has been in the past, but uh, today I guess that's a vote of confidence at any rate that uh, he didn't come out of the campaign too badly off financially. Well, I think uh, on a senator's salary you can afford a couple pairs of shoes. They're not, uh, they're not badly paid. <laughs> All right, Bruce. The uh, uh, reports from a well, uh, as we have been reporting them to you, indicate that uh, President Nixon certainly is going to win and probably with a record margin of votes, perhaps over that 61.8 that uh, President uh, Johnson was re-elected by in 1964 over Barry Goldwater. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. We might emphasize here that uh, the figures we've been posting so far are preliminary ones. Our CBS News estimates are derived from selected sample precincts across the country. The voting and counting of those votes is far from over uh, across the United States as a whole. State and local offices, many public questions often are decided by very small margins. So we urge you, if you can still vote in your state, in your area, uh, why you ought to go out and do your duty and do so. Now let's go to the south uh, and a report from there. Roger Mike. Walter, uh, since we last left you, our uh, solid south was uh, two states solid to the Republicans, and it's grown since our last report. And now uh, you can see the difference uh, with the addition to uh, President Nixon's column of Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. So uh, already uh, in the south, he's picked up five of those 13 states. Just reading quickly, at our vote profile precincts in the South. In 1968, Richard Nixon carried 32% uh, of the vote in the South from the rural and small towns. Tonight, 75%. The big difference, again, is the George Wallace vote from four years ago. In uh, 1968, Hubert Humphrey picked up 36% uh, of those districts that normally vote 
uh, solidly Democratic. Uh, President Nixon got 35% of them. Tonight, President Nixon carrying 68% of the vote from the high Democratic districts. In uh, Florida tonight, our vote profile analysis indicates the president again has taken Florida, which has gone Republican over the last 20 years. The uh, percentage ultimately indicates 72-28 for Richard Nixon in Florida. The popular vote in Florida to date, with uh, about 8% of the vote in, shows Richard Nixon uh, leading 3-1 uh, to one there. In uh, Georgia, with 12 electoral votes, President Nixon is the winner there, 2% of the vote in, leading about 4-1. to one. In the Alabama presidential race, the president is the winner there, according to our vote estimate. Our popular vote shows 2% in, leading about 4-1 uh, to one there. In Kentucky, in the presidential race, 79% of that vote in, he won that state uh, at least an hour ago. They're running a little less than uh, two to one. In the Tennessee presidential race, 33% in with 10 electoral votes from Tennessee, already won by Richard Nixon. The popular vote shows him running about two to one. And in the Tennessee vote profile analysis indicates the ultimate percentage there will be 71-29. In the Tennessee senatorial race, we have a winner there, Howard Baker, the Republican incumbent, going for his second term, has now defeated Ray Blanton, a Democrat from central Tennessee who was redistricted. But tonight, Howard Baker has won, although he did not pull the vote that Richard Nixon did. And finally, in the Kentucky Senate race, Louis Nunn, the former Republican governor, is now trailing Walter D. Huddleston, the Democrat, by about uh, 20,000 votes. This is a seat, seat that the Republicans must keep to win control of the Senate. And also tonight, uh, Walter, we have a, an interesting Senate race in Alabama. John Sparkman, who has been in the Senate since uh, 1946, has defeated Winton Red Blunt, the former Postmaster General, and uh, that was really no surprise. It was one of the GOP's last hopes to break through the solid South in the Senate. And finally, as an indication of what coattails are and what they are not, in the Kentucky race tonight, in the third district, which is the uh, congressional district around Louisville, Romano Mazzoli, who won in 1970 with the closest margin of any Kentucky, of any uh, congressional district in the state, 211 votes, tonight has defeated his Republican opponent, this time 60% to 40%. So President Nixon's presence on the ballot didn't help any Republican in that district. Indicates that there is uh, ticket splitting going on, certainly uh, there, at any rate. Not only there, but also just uh, looking at the boards in Alabama. You, we mentioned the Red Blunt, John Sparkman race. Uh, Richard Nixon there, a five to one leader over uh, McGovern in the Alabama president, but in the uh, Alabama Senate, it's Sparkman about three to two. Wasn't it expected that Blunt would do a little better than that, actually? They hoped he would do better. <laughs> but it wasn't expected. John Sparkman carried with him, Walter, a, a, a thick black book. And in it was a list of every pork barrel uh, and public service project he ever brought home for Alabama. Pork barrel, if you're on the other side, it's public service if you're on that side. Well, I used uh, both definitions, so Mr. Blunt wouldn't call. And... Our popular vote now is still at around 3% of the national vote, uh, one million uh, and a half almost for President Nixon, uh, 693,000 for President, uh, for, for uh, uh, Senator McGovern. Uh, that's a 67 to 32% uh, spread. Let's go now to the Middle West and Dan Rather. Dan? Rotor, Ohio, and Indiana are the stories in the Midwest at the moment. In Ohio, our CBS News uh, estimate is that President Nixon uh, has carried Ohio. This is with 4% of the precincts reporting. That was the uh, vote in and tabulated. But our CBS News estimate is that President Nixon uh, has won Ohio with uh, something on the order of 61% of the vote. Now, and an analysis of how that happened, uh, according to our close look at our own sample precincts, runs this way. President Nixon in Ohio is doing uh, roughly 16% uh, better this time than he did in 1968, mostly on the basis of getting virtually all of the old Wallace votes and 
a few more votes than he got the last time in the suburban areas. Now, George McGovern is uh, running in Ohio about 4% behind the totals of uh, Senator Hubert Humphrey in 1968. It's rare that anyone wins the presidency without carrying Ohio, and President Nixon has not only won Ohio, but he has done it uh, in devastating fashion, if our CBS News estimate is correct. Interesting enough, in Ohio, as is the case uh, in Indiana, President Nixon running better in the uh, uh, black communities uh, than he did in 1968, uh, coming close to doubling his margins in the black communities of Ohio. That on the basis of very early returns, although to repeat for emphasis, uh, CBS News estimates that President Nixon has won the state of Ohio. In Indiana, as we told you a bit earlier, President Nixon uh, apparently has won Indiana with 27% of the precincts, and uh, he has uh, a margin of better than, uh, well, about three to one over George McGovern. But our CBS News estimate in Indiana is that President Nixon's uh, final total in uh, Indiana will be on the order of 67%. Now, in the Indiana governor's race, uh, a coattail effect uh, possibly there, although some thought that the Republican Otis Bowen, uh, the Speaker of the Indiana House, and a physician would take that race anyway. But in the Indiana gubernatorial race, with the, our CBS News estimate is that uh, Bowen's final total may be on the order of 59%. I know with all these figures uh, coming at you, percentages, sample precincts, and what have you, it's very hard to keep this in any kind of perspective. But if what has happened in Ohio and Indiana holds uh, for the rest of the Midwest, it's far too early to say that it will, but uh, particularly with Ohio, you've got some indicators that it may. Uh, what you may see here is President Nixon winding up with an all-time landslide margin. That's uh, the outer perimeter of what we're dealing with in the Midwest based on these uh, sample precincts in Indiana and Ohio because the president is running extremely strong in the suburban areas. In some suburban areas of Ohio, the president carried by better than 70%. He's running uh, double what he did before in black communities. The only two areas uh, in terms of voter demographics in Indiana and Ohio that George McGovern did well in were uh, low-income areas, very low-income areas, and, and in the black community. While we say that George McGovern did uh, not as well in the black community as uh, Hubert Humphrey did, still those are the only two areas in Ohio and Indiana that he's carrying. If this holds, what we may be seeing in the Midwest, Walter, is not just a landslide, but the beginning of a glacier. <laughs> the, uh, well, of course, what President Nixon would like would be uh, a landslide uh, proportions to give him a record, and that would uh, take over 61% of the vote. Uh, President uh, Johnson got 61.1%, I believe it was, in 1964 over Senator Goldwater. We can now say, uh, on the basis of our CBS News uh, sample precinct uh, analysis, uh, that uh, President Nixon has won in Virginia. Another southern state falling to him, so that uh, the uh, southern south, uh, the solid south, once solidly Democratic, looks this year, as Roger Mudd has told you before, solidly Republican. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. Let's take a look at our eastern states now with Mike Wallace. Mike. The president has carried Vermont, which is no surprise, with three electoral votes. Let's take a look at the uh, boards and see that 4% of the precincts are reporting in Vermont, with Mr. Nixon running about 2 to 1 ahead of Senator McGovern. But when you take a look at vote profiles analysis, CBS News estimate, we do not have any figures on the CBS News estimate for Vermont, but we do know that the president will carry Vermont with its three electoral votes. Uh, what we're looking for in the East, of course, is what Mr. Nixon will do in the way of a landslide here as well as in the Republican heartland. Back in 1960, he took just 11 electoral votes in all of the eastern states. In 1968, he took 27 electoral votes. There are 144 of them here, and he is hoping tonight to take at least 127 of the electoral votes in the eastern United States. Walter? Nixon has won Illinois. That's our CBS News estimate on the basis of our sample precincts in Illinois, one of the major states which it was considered that uh, Senator McGovern had to win in order to have a chance at this year's election has now fallen to uh, President Nixon. And that big block of electoral votes from Illinois goes into his uh, column. He now has 133 uh, votes, just uh, electoral votes, that is, just five electoral votes short of uh, half of the 270 he needs to win the presidency. 
He has now uh, 1,750,000 votes to McGovern's 828,000, holding on to a 67 to 32% uh, margin of landslide proportions. We'll be back shortly with more results from election night 72, but first, the latest from our local stations on the races in your area. This is Walter Cronkite at our CBS News election headquarters. I got it, I got it. This is CBS. So across the United States, a landslide of very possibly record proportions is a building up for President Nixon. As state after state falls into uh, his column tonight on this election night, 1972, 12 of the states so far uh, have uh, been uh, uh, determined to be for President Nixon this year, most of them from the solid south. Uh, and uh, there are no states uh, where Senator McGovern seems to be leading at this moment. Let's go now to the Solid South, where Roger Mudd is our reporter. Actually, right here, but we call it the Solid South. <laughs> yeah. Walter, uh, the only thing I can tell you is that Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Texas are still out. And uh, already... Uh, the, the other states in the South have all dropped into the Nixon column. So that uh, now we can say that uh, with uh, South Carolina, our latest call, 10% of the popular vote in, Richard Nixon there, uh, four to one. Our uh, South Carolina state gives us eight electoral votes. Following uh, Virginia, our vote profile analysis in Virginia indicates uh, the president will win there 70% to 30%. Virginia has long been a Republican state breaking away from the Democrats back in 1952. The popular vote in Virginia now, with about 6% in, shows the president uh, a little under 30,000, George McGovern about 15,000. So the, the message is from all of this, uh, if this is such a landslide, will he bring uh, Republican senatorial candidates in the South with him? That had been the hope of the GOP, but the answer is tonight that he will not. And just for the next moment or two, we'll take a look at the southern senatorial races beginning in Alabama. There, the uh, five-term incumbent, John Sparkman, the Democrat, has won re-election. Overwhelming uh, Winton Blunt, 62 percent, 36 percent. John LaFleur, the black candidate from a Mobile, about 2 percent. In Georgia... That seat is remaining Democratic. That's the old Richard Russell seat, and State Representative Sam Nunn from south of Atlanta has defeated Fletcher Thompson, who was a Republican congressman, got an awful lot of help from uh, the administration, but tonight uh, didn't make it. In Kentucky, there, a Republican seat for the last 18 years. Tonight, apparently, has gone Democratic. That was the John Sherman Cooper seat. Louis Nunn, the ex-Republican governor working for it, but Walter Huddleston, state Democratic uh, majority leader, apparently has defeated Mr. Nunn. In North Carolina, our returns are not substantial, but that is another very close race. Uh, that's for the seat uh, vacated by B. Everett Jordan, who was defeated by Nick Galifianakis, the Democrat from Durham, former congressman. He's opposed by conservative television commentator Jesse Helms from Raleigh. In South Carolina, Strom Thurmond is expected to be re-elected easily. He is opposed by Nick Ziegler, a Harvard graduate, who the other day was endorsed by George Wallace. But that is, if Strom Thurmond loses tonight, it uh, will be about like George McGovern winning. That's what the chances would be there. And in Tennessee, Howard Baker, the Republican, has been re-elected. And in Virginia, we have a very tight race between uh, Republican Congressman William Scott from uh, Northern Virginia against Senator William Spong, the Democratic incumbent. The returns still are not uh, large, and that is too close to call. So, Walter, just the last line is the Republicans will not get control of the Senate. Let's go now to the Middle West, where we can get more on that race. And uh, Dan Rather uh, can tell us about the surprisingly large uh, margin of Nixon's victory in Illinois. A few scattered returns in the uh, vote tabulation, the actual votes in. But our CBS News estimate in that Illinois governor's race is that uh, the incumbent Republican governor, Richard Ogilvy, who was thought to be in some trouble behind uh, Daniel Walker, the uh, Democratic challenger, our CBS News estimate is that Ogilvy is leading uh, with about 54% of the vote. Now, we're not prepared to say definitely that Ogilvy has uh, beaten Walker, but if that holds up uh, anywhere near that percentage, it's fair to say 
that the dimensions of the Nixon victory in Illinois, running close, if not indeed taking the city of Chicago, Nixon taking Cook County, uh, was enough to bring in Richard Ogilvy. The only areas in the whole state of Illinois, Walter, that uh, where George McGovern has uh, run anywhere close to uh, ahead, he's been ahead in uh, some of the black districts, he's been ahead in some of the very low income uh, districts. Uh, that's the dimension of it for the moment. Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, uh, uh, as we say, a uh, kind of political doomsday machine operating for the moment. The races we need to watch uh, in terms of continuing interest for the evening now. Michigan, we have only a few scattered returns in there. A very close Senate race expected between the Republican incumbent Griffin and Frank Kelly, the Democratic challenger. For the moment, the Midwest looks uh, Republican. Dan, have you got anything yet on uh, state's attorney Ed Hanrahan's race, uh, which would give us some indication of uh, how well the daily machine is operating? Well, in exactly. For uh, political science aficionados, that's the race to watch. Bernard Carey, the Republican, trying for the state's attorney's office in Cook County. Uh, Edward Handrahan, the incumbent in the Daily Man. The Daily Machine went in operation for George McGovern primarily to get Edward Handrahan elected. Now, we don't have enough returns to uh, even talk uh, knowingly about how that race is going because they count those votes late. But with the dimensions of the Nixon victory in the uh, Cook County area, uh, it could well be that Henry Hand's in trouble. And if he is, that's real trouble for the machine. Walter, also, I'm just told that we have the first incumbent, Democratic incumbent in the Midwest in the House, uh, defeated incumbent Democrat Andrew Jacobs in Indiana's 11th district. Uh, apparently has been beaten by the Republican challenger, William Hudnut, and I think it's fair to say that that's a coattail effect. Uh, Jacob's district had been, uh, he had been redistricted, and he was thought to be in uh, some difficulty, but the dimensions of the Nixon victory in Indiana were so large as to send uh, Democrat Congressman Andrew Jacobs down to defeat. That knocks one of the uh, liberals out of the House uh, leadership structure. I mean, you're down the ladder away, but he was in that group. And it may be, Walter, as we mentioned before, that there'll be some other Democrats in Indiana go down. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. The worst beating ever taken by a Republican presidential candidate or any presidential candidate uh, in the last 135 or 40 years uh, was that administered to Alf Landon in the 1936 presidential race by Franklin Delano Roosevelt running in his first uh, re-election campaign. That's as far as electoral vote goes, because Alf Landon carried just two states, Maine and Vermont, with a total of eight electoral votes. Tonight, so far, Senator McGovern has no electoral votes to 150 uh, for uh, President uh, Nixon. And uh, uh, earlier today, Alf Landon voted out in Topeka, Kansas, and he's said uh, right out loud there that he certainly hoped Nixon uh, erased uh, his record for losing and uh, administered an even greater defeat to uh, Senator McGovern tonight, which would mean something less than eight electoral votes. At the Nixon headquarters in Washington's Shoreham Hotel, Dan Shore and Michelle Clark are with the president's campaign director, Clark McGregor. Uh, the first thing that we must report to you is that tonight, in about three hours from now, between 11.15 and 11.30, President Nixon and Vice President Agnew will be here to take part in the celebration of the Republican workers. As I understand it, they will be here whether or not Senator McGovern has conceded by that time. It's some question as to whether a concession from Senator McGovern at this point is even necessary. The fact of the landslide is there. What remains only to be determined are the dimensions of that landslide. Clark McGregor, who took over this campaign from John Mitchell, has been pouring over figures with a big smile on his face and wants to give us some idea of what this landslide means. Well, one of the things uh, that's very encouraging to us is uh, the pattern of voting in uh, the city of Cleveland and in Cuyahoga County, the area around the city of Cleveland, including the city. Mayor Ralph Perk has been on the phone to me, and uh, Cleveland, in many ways, and its immediate suburbs, is a microcosm of urban America, and it's going for the president by more than 60 percent, which uh, is better than any of us had hoped. And it does indicate a strong uh, vote of uh, confidence in the president's leadership, which means a great deal to the president in terms of uh, his capacity uh, for accomplishment in the next four years. Mr. McGregor, earlier today, Herb Klein said 48 states, but he was still questioning Massachusetts and West Virginia. Walter has given indications already that uh, West Virginia may very well make it 49. How many states do you think 
uh, the president will win in terms of electoral votes? We have a lot of states to hear from in uh, the mountain states and the west coast, but uh, the president's support has been fairly uniform nationwide, and it does appear to me as though the president will win 49 states. Polls in Massachusetts just closed 20 minutes ago. We won't get meaningful returns from Massachusetts for 10 or 15 minutes. I think it would be... Uh, almost impossible for the president to carry Massachusetts, but he might do it. Mr. McGregor, one of the questions before has been uh, what kind of president President Nixon will be if he gets this, this landslide vote of confidence you've been talking about. What do you think? Uh, well, uh, I don't think that you can uh, describe the second Nixon uh, presidency in ideological terms. I think you'll find it's more uh, pragmatic. Uh, it's problem solving. I think he'll be um, He'll be free to, with a strong vote of support that he's received, to look at the various options, pick out a solution that really works, and affect change that works. The president's favorite phrase in terms of progressive or constructive change is change that works. And I think you'll see that applied to every problem. Will there be more emphasis on domestic issues than foreign policy? That's one of the things that's been speculated. Not necessarily, but he'll be more effective in his domestic uh, policy leadership because the Congress will be more responsive to his initiatives. Talks are the, uh, while the uh, victory for the president seems clear, it does not seem as though uh, the Republicans are going to win Congress. Will it be an effort to get some of the Democratic senators, say, to switch in order to be able to organize the Senate? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I think a lot of them are going to feel uncomfortable when their states have gone three or four or five to one for Richard Nixon. We've tabulated answers from some 8,200 voters. We've tabulated answers from some 8,200 voters. Uh, CBS News uh, questioned uh, uh, as they left the polls today uh, that as of the middle of the day, our figure showed something like this of those people we questioned. About 10% of the 8,200 were blacks. And we found that the black vote was going four to one for McGovern. The jobless voters in those same surveys were going 50 to 47 for McGovern. And not a very large margin there for uh, McGovern, who uh, had based a lot of his appeal on the underprivileged and uh, the jobless in the country. But in most other categories, it certainly looks like a Nixon sweep. Among uh, the whites, uh, the old people, even the youth, they're not going heavily for McGovern. According to our survey, that was running only a couple of percentage points in favor of Senator McGovern. It was an area where he had hoped to win a very large and deep. Blue-collar voters, 16% of our sample, went 57 to 40 for the president. White-collar voters, one-third of our sample, lined up exactly two to one for the president. Mr. Nixon was winning the over 65 vote in our survey by more than two to one. The Catholic vote so far stacking up 56% to 43% for Nixon, and uh, that had uh, always been a heavy uh, Democratic area uh, for the last uh, uh, 44 years at any rate. The, uh, uh, President Nixon is losing, however, the Jewish vote, according to our sample at the polling booths, among voters we sampled, and by a margin of almost two to one. At one time early on in the campaign, it was thought that uh, Senator McGovern was in trouble with the Jewish voters, but apparently they have come back to the Democratic Party in recent weeks. We now can add Maryland to Senator, uh, uh, to President Nixon's uh, list of states won, and that gives uh, President Nixon 185 to have the electoral votes needed to, toward, the, uh, uh, toward the 270. Uh, rather, that figure should be 212. Excuse me, I did not add Maryland in. With Maryland in, it's 212 votes now for President Nixon. Uh, he is not very far away from the 270 he needs for election to his second term. A man who uh, won uh, his first term uh, with uh, a, uh, not even a majority of the votes. Looks like he's going into his second term with a, a popular majority heavier than any man in American history, excepting only George Washington in his, the third terms uh, he ran as our first president. In the Senate, uh, however, there have been no changes as yet uh, so far. The coattail effect of President Nixon doesn't seem to be that broad, uh, that long. Uh, there have been five uh, Republicans elected so far and three Democrats. It looks like the makeup of the Senate, if this trend continues across the country, will be about what it was before. The Republicans will not pick up the five votes they need uh, to gain control of the Senate. 
Much the same is happening with some very scattered returns in the House so far. And now another one of those big states has fallen to uh, President Nixon. It is Pennsylvania, and with a very high majority for President Nixon, 62 to 38 uh, for the president, Pennsylvania. Uh, those, uh, state, uh, those votes from uh, Pennsylvania now go into uh, the president's column. There are 27 of them. That'll give him 239 toward the 270 needed. Uh, he is only 31 votes away from re-election. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. The eighth of the once solid southern states has now gone for President Nixon. According to our CBS News estimate, Mississippi can be put in President Nixon's column. Uh, Strom Thurmond, who uh, once ran as the president, uh, presidential candidate on the state's rights ticket in 1948, which may have started the Republican landslide toward the Republicans of this year, has won his uh, Senate race for re-election to a fourth term uh, in South Carolina. And uh, President Nixon has won Kansas, as expected, but with a very high majority, 69% to 31% for McGovern. That's the 18th state that uh, President Nixon has won. Uh, his electoral vote is mounting very close to the 270 he needs for re-election. Let's go now to the east, and Mike Wallace. Kent. Mike, I called upon you. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, Walter. <laughs> Let's take a look at uh, what has happened in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Connecticut in those presidential races. And we'll begin to understand the dimensions of the president's sweep in the Northeast, where, as I said a little bit earlier, his high point has been 27 electoral votes up to now. Just in those three states, he takes uh, something over 42 electoral votes. Pennsylvania, first of all, you can see that only 2% of precincts are reporting, according to the tabulated vote, 45,000 to 24,000. But CBS News estimates that when all the votes are in in Pennsylvania, the president will have won by a whopping 62%, over McGovern's 38%, and his coattails are bound to make some difference in congressional races in that state. There is no senatorial or gubernatorial race there. Let's go to New Jersey. With 15% of the precincts reporting, 150,000 to 75,000 odd. But when all the votes are in, CBS News estimates that in New Jersey, 62% for Richard Nixon, 38% for George McGovern. And there are two congressional seats in particular, those of Congressman Helstosky and Congressman Howard, Democratic congressmen who are in serious trouble, obviously, in New Jersey. And finally, in Connecticut. Connecticut is bound to be one of the most democratic states in the nation. John Kennedy took it over Richard Nixon with 54% of the vote. Lyndon Johnson won it with 68% of the vote. Hubert Humphrey took 50% of the vote last time around with George Wallace getting 6%. With 12% of the precincts reporting at 62,000 to 47,000, but CBS News estimates that when all the votes are in, it'll be a 60-40 win in Connecticut for President Nixon, and no one had suggested that it was going to be that big. Now let's take a look at how those votes are being put together. Let's start with Connecticut, where we just were. In high Democratic areas, high Democratic areas, the President is running 23 points ahead of his run against Hubert Humphrey. In moderate Democratic areas, he's running 25 points ahead of last time. In blue-collar areas, 26% ahead. In white-collar areas, 16%. Now, Connecticut is a ethnic state, labor state, blue-collar state, Catholic state. Mr. Nixon is obviously running well ahead of where he was four years ago in all of those, with all of those groups. The same thing is true with Pennsylvania. In moderately democratic areas in Pennsylvania, he's running 25 points ahead of last time. High democratic areas, eight points ahead. Low income, 12 ahead. Mid income, 14 ahead. Blue collar, 17 ahead. White collar, 10 points ahead. And of course, the same thing is true in New Jersey. He won New Jersey the last time around. Incidentally, in New Jersey, CBS News estimates that uh, Clifford Case has been returned to the Senate, no surprise there, with something over 60% of the vote against Paul Krebs. Incidentally, on that one, Paul Krebs was at one time president of the uh, CIO in New Jersey, and yet the state AFL-CIO, the state AFL-CIO endorsed Clifford Case this time around. There is only one place 
in the East up to now where the president's coattails, where the president's coattails perhaps are not working as well as they had been expected to. No, wait a moment. They are. In the gubernatorial race in West Virginia, CBS News now estimates that Governor Arch Moore will be returned to the State House, and Jay Rockefeller's bid to take that State House away from him evidently has gone down to defeat. The man they call the palace populist, some of them, he was called a carpetbagger by some other of his detractors. It was suggested that after uh, only four years as uh, Secretary of State there, and two years prior to that in the House, uh, in the Assembly in West Virginia, perhaps the young Jay Rockefeller was taking on more of a contest than he ought to, to run for governor at the age of 35. He spent a million and a half dollars. The national press was down there looking at him. Arch Moore spent about a half a million dollars. And as you see, when the votes are in, according to CBS News estimate, perhaps on the coattails of President Nixon, Arch Moore will be returned with 55% of the vote to Jay Rockefeller's 45% in West Virginia. Walter? What will that do, uh, do you think, to Jay Rockefeller's political future, Mike? Well, he's building a house down there, which uh, somebody said costs about $350,000. He has indicated Mrs. Rockefeller, Sharon Percy, Chuck Percy's daughter, has uh, indicated they intend to, I think she said, we're going to live and die in West Virginia. So obviously he's going to go out and try again. That's uh, one of the stories, of course, of any election year, is what happens to those young men who are coming up, those who manage to buck a landslide and still uh, win out to defy the coattail effect, always will be looked at the most favorably as the politicians uh, look to the future of their party. In this case, it'll be the Democratic Party that'll be looking to those who uh, defied the landslide. By the same token, uh, uh, those uh, on the Republican side will have to show uh, great pulling strength uh, to keep up with the front of the ticket, President Nixon, in other words. And as Dan Rather pointed out to you earlier, this could have an effect in Illinois, where Senator Percy has high hopes for 1976, but uh, didn't uh, lead the ticket in Illinois. He ended up, uh, it looks like, according to our CBS News estimate, will end up without quite the percentage that uh, the president is taking Illinois. Dan, you've got a couple of calls in the Middle West, uh, I think, on our VPA estimate. If you'd like to come in with them right now. Well, indeed, Walter, uh, Kansas, uh, CBS News estimates, uh, has gone for President Nixon, and uh, we have uh, results in several other races in Kansas, so let's take a look at it all the way through. First, the votes that are actually in and tabulated uh, in the state of Kansas. Not that many of them uh, in at the moment. Uh, our CBS uh, News boards, with 2% of the precincts reporting, uh, President Nixon running uh, almost 3 to 1 ahead of George McGovern, but our CBS News estimate in Kansas is that the president's final margin may be on the order of 69%, and we estimate that President Nixon has carried Kansas. Of course, Kansas is one of the most rock-ribbed uh, Republican states anywhere, if not the most rock-ribbed Republican state. In the senatorial race in Kansas, a winner there, uh, Senator James Pearson, to the surprise of no one, running uh, very well ahead of Arch Tetzlaff, the one-time member of the uh, German Luftwaffe, now a naturalized American citizen. Our CBS News estimate is that uh, Senator Pearson not only has been re-elected in Kansas, but he's been re-elected by a margin approaching 72 percent, and he may be one of the few Republican senators anywhere to run ahead of President Nixon this time. In the Kansas governor's race, a race that uh, few people thought could be close, uh, Governor Robert Docking uh, running well ahead with 2 percent of the precincts reporting in the tabulated vote. Our CBS News estimate is in the Kansas gubernatorial race that uh, Governor Docking's final winning margin may be in the order of uh, 62 percent. Now, Docking is a Democrat. Uh, th this is be his fourth consecutive term. Uh, he's running uh, against the nationwide trend, of course, but Docking is known in Kansas as a super conservative, although he is a Democrat, and uh, our CBS News estimate is that Governor Docking has been reelected. Now, we don't have enough in the Illinois governor's race, uh, which is expected to be one of the uh, closest races anywhere in the country, to uh, make a lot out of it as yet. The figures as of the moment in the Illinois governor's race, this is the one between the incumbent Republican governor, Richard Ogilvy, and Daniel Walker, the Democratic challenger. It could be close. Illinois uh, is a landslide for Nixon, and Governor Ogilvy was hoping to grab the Nixon coattails enough to beat Daniel Walker, but with 2% of the precincts uh, in and reporting, most of these in uh, and around Cook County, Daniel Walker out ahead of Governor Ogilvy. Our CBS News estimate uh, in Illinois is that uh, there's no trend as yet. So uh, that'll be one to watch, Walter, that Illinois governor's race, because the uh, incumbent uh, Republican governor in Illinois 
could be in trouble despite the Nixon landslide if the present, uh, what we, well, it's too early to say a trend, but he could be in trouble there. Very quickly in Michigan, not enough of the actual vote in and tabulated to even talk about, but our CBS News estimate is that President Nixon uh, has a significant lead in Michigan, uh, leading by about 66%. Uh, now, quickly jumping to Missouri, CBS News estimates that uh, Richard Nixon has carried the state of Missouri. These are the actual figures, uh, but the CBS News estimate is this. Uh, we estimate that uh, President Nixon's final winning total in Missouri may be on the order of 62 percent. Now, what that could mean in Missouri, there is a very close, uh, what was expected to be, a very close uh, gubernatorial race there between Christopher Kitt Bond a 33-year-old uh, Republican state auditor, and Edward Dowd, a former FBI man, the Democrat. If President Nixon's uh, coattails hold up in Missouri, if his winning margin is on the order of 62%, that means that he probably will carry in with him in Missouri a uh, Republican governor. Uh, Walter, we, if you're feeling uh, low tonight or know anyone who is, you might tell them about 19-year-old Scott Debro. He hitchhiked all the way from Jackson, Wyoming to Rochester, Minnesota, to cast a vote uh, in person for George McGovern when he found out it was too late to cast an absentee ballot. And I have an idea that while we can applaud uh, young Mr. Deblow's uh, persistence in getting his vote in, that he may feel that it's an awful long ride back to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. <laughs> he did a little better than a, an elderly lady up in New Hampshire who showed up at the polls to be told she was dead. <laughs> they, they checked the registration rolls and said, uh, they said, I'm sorry, you died. Well, that's the and reverse she... of what sometimes happens in uh, South Texas and in uh, Chicago, isn't it, when uh, uh, dead people manage to vote? <laughs> yeah, and uh, maybe, uh, yes. Uh, Walter, you may also be interested to know that John Ashbrook uh, has been reelected in Ohio in what uh, some thought might be a closer congressional race than that. The president's uh, coattails appear to be holding up very well in some of those uh, Ohio congressional races. And three more states now have uh, gone into President Nixon's column, according to our, uh, to our estimates here, uh, based on the precinct, uh, uh, the, the sample precincts. They are Delaware, Oklahoma, and North Carolina. And now a fourth, North Dakota, which puts the president uh, within a couple of electoral votes of those necessary to uh, win. He is very close to a victory for his second term, according to our CBS News estimates. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. According to our CBS News estimate, President Nixon has been re-elected. He has gone over the top with Michigan's 21 electoral votes for a total of 286. He needed 270. So President Nixon has been re-elected according to our CBS News estimate. And let's go now to the Republican headquarters at the Shoreham Hotel in Washington. scene at the Shoreham Hotel, the Republican National Headquarters. Uh, they don't seem to have gotten the word there yet. Uh, maybe they weren't listening, or, uh, or perhaps they already have been uh, so assured of victory tonight that uh, the announcement from us that our sample precincts <laughs> put the president over hardly count. At any rate, that's what we say. We'll be back shortly with more results from election night 72, but first the latest from our local stations on the races in your area. This is Walter Grand Guide to CBS. Other states in which we have uh, selected precinct reports so far, uh, President Nixon is leading. It seems to be a margin building to an all-time record landslide. Senator McGovern has yet to win a single state. There are no electoral votes in his column. In the tabulated popular vote, it looks like this. 6,209,000 for the president, 3,137,000 for Senator McGovern. The president dropped a little bit in the percentages as these figures have been tabulated and got up to that 12% of the precincts in so far. He's down now to 66% uh, to 33 for uh, Senator McGovern. Exactly a two to one margin. 
John Smith's the American Independent Party candidate. That was the ticket on which George Wallace ran in 1968 as uh, just around 1% of the votes so far, 114,000 uh, votes. The states uh, that uh, the president has won so far include all but two of the 13 in the once solid Democratic uh, South. Uh, the two states that we have no reports on yet are uh, Arkansas and Louisiana, but the president has won Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and West Virginia, and all of them by very sizable majorities, too. None of them under 65 percent, most of them over 70 percent. He has won in the Middle West, Illinois, and Indiana, Kansas, Michigan, Missouri, North Dakota, Ohio. Uh, in the East, he's won Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and West Virginia. None of the western states are in yet, and that gives us an opportunity again to remind you that while these sample precincts and the fast returns provided to us by uh, the uh, News Election Service uh, that uh, provides, that uh, is a joint effort that provides all of the networks and the press services now, uh, those fast returns plus our selected precincts enable us to tell you that uh, the president has won uh, election uh, with an overwhelming majority it would appear uh, we must remind you that polls are open in 10 states yet will be for some time uh, that there are still senate and gubernatorial races that would count out there the margin of the president's victory is an important matter there are 7,000 state legislators to be elected across the country tonight a half a million local offices all the way from uh, mayor to dog catcher and uh, a lot of uh, important issues on the ballot, bond issues and other matters on the ballots in these states. So it is important to get out and vote, regardless of the fact that we are able now to share with you the kind of knowledge that in the past only a few old pals sitting around in those back rooms with the cigar smoke heavy and the little black books were able to do. That's all we do with this uh, vote profile analysis is to tell you what they used to know only to themselves that uh, with a certain number of votes in from a certain number of precincts, they knew who was going to win. Well, now you know as much as they used to know alone. In the Senate, uh, the importance uh, has been there whether President Nixon could uh, pull in uh, at least uh, five extra Republican senators in order to uh, give him uh, a majority in the Senate. Here is who has won so far in the Senate. You see that list as they roll by uh, there just at that moment. Uh, we just added onto that list West Virginia's uh, uh, Randolph and uh, Kentucky's Huddleston. I thought uh, we had them before, but I guess we just put them on the list. There they are again. Those are the Republicans who have won, but uh, they have not taken any seats yet uh, from the Democrats. The Democrats have not taken any seats from the Republicans yet. Uh, and so far, it looks like the Senate will be made up of about uh, the same proportion as at the moment uh, with the Republican, uh, the Democrats with a five vote uh, majority. In the House races, they are going much the same way so far, although we don't have enough for races in yet to give you a clear indication of that. In the House, with 435 seats up, that's all the House voting seats. The Republicans have won 32 so far, the Democrats 81. The Republicans need to pick up 39 seats in the House in order to win a majority there. For a reaction to President Nixon's huge win tonight, Michelle Clark and Dan Shore with the Presidential Counselor Robert Finch. It's kind of fitting in a way that at the moment that the word has come here that the president in projections is over the top, the man who should be sitting with us is probably President Nixon's oldest friend in politics, the man who ran his unsuccessful 1960 campaign, has just flown in with the president who will be here later tonight, Bob Finch, former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. Mr. Finch, as you travel with the president, what was he expecting and what was his mood? Well, let me just describe uh, the, what was on, happening on the plane. Unlike, say, 1968, uh, Dan, when the tension was so uh, thick you could cut it with a knife, uh, everyone on Air Force One was uh, relaxed, uh, optimistic, um, and uh, it was a, just a different world. Were there predictions being made? No, there wasn't even You can tell now. Uh, you know, ordinarily, you have bets uh, about what will the margin be, and. Uh, it's not that kind of thing at all. You mean nobody said 48, 49, 50 states? Well, we'd all pretty well weighed in with our votes. Uh, our expectations, 48 states, was my 
my prediction, or Clyde's prediction, and others. I think we'll stand by that. Did he speculate at all as to what this kind of landslide victory would be? No. How did this differ for you from 1960? Well, of course, in fall history, uh, the early returns from New England, which was uh, Kennedy's home bailiwick, showed a strong margin for him, and I, I think the commentators were predicting a, a Kennedy sweep. Uh, but uh, as the further west we came, it was close. It became obvious it was going to be a closer and closer election. And of course, it wasn't until the following morning that the very, very close uh, nature of it uh, finally became apparent. Less than one vote per precinct. So that was a real cliffhanger and a great deal of anguish and emotion uh, was involved in that. Do these results tonight pretty well settle it that you'll be running in California for office yourself on these very long coattails? This didn't decide that. Uh, uh, but I, I will certainly go back and look at governor and senator, but that, governor I think what the president senator. has done here gives the Republicans an enormous opportunity if we can, his, his leadership and the way he brought, he tried to carry the issues forward, and it was his plan, it was his leadership, uh, now it's a question of whether the party can measure up to, to what he As you were saying, governor or senator? I, I, I have to go back and talk to a lot of people, including my wife, and I'm going to... But there's no question that two years from now you will be running for office in California. The, the probabilities are good. Can you pinch? Can yes, you tell us? Uh, I wonder, if, do you have any theory as to uh, why, with such an overwhelming victory for President Nixon, uh, there, there don't seem to be, uh, he doesn't seem to be carrying along uh, a lot of the senatorial candidates? Well, it, it's a complicated thing, uh, who gerrymandered the districts and so on, but I, I believe that because the foreign policy issue was very overriding in this, and, and that is uniquely in the hands of the president and people have, have confidence in his ability, his understanding of this globe, that weighed very heavily, and they don't attach the same importance with regard to the Congress or obviously the state houses or uh, even the Senate, which does have the function of ratifying treaties. The president shortchanged the Republican Party in amassing a coalition around himself? In no way. We, he, he, uh, we, all of us as surrogates, his cabinet members were out campaigning, his family was out, he took pictures with all the candidates, wrote letters, uh, he did everything a man could do and still do the job as president. And uh, because it, it, he's had a heavy, very heavy burden to carry with the Vietnam negotiations. I think that's it. The Dan here, Walter, is at the big up screen as CBS says, and one New York. <laughs> Dan, they got the word kind of late down there. Uh, yeah, it was just it was just up on the board, Walter, uh, well, that uh, the reason President for all this Nixon won New York. Walter, That's what the reaction they, they is about. They have a screen here where they pick up news from the networks. They just happen to pick up from CBS that President Nixon has won New York, which has somehow resulted in the loudest cheer we have yet heard here tonight. As you know, the president and vice president actually will be here themselves in a couple of hours to join this celebration. Dan, uh, I don't, I'm afraid they didn't get that from New York. Uh, we haven't yet, uh, I mean, from CBS, we haven't yet said that New York uh, uh, has been won by President Nixon, but uh, uh, if, if they want to uh, go along on that basis, uh, perhaps they can. Well, what they're saying exactly, if I could read it to you, is President Nixon wins New York, CBS says. Well, all right. Uh, let, 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 <laughs> let, let them live in the happiness of having won New York uh, from CBS. Uh, we're, we're still counting votes and sampling our uh, sample precincts in New York. There's no question that President Nixon is winning an overwhelming victory across the nation, though. And uh, adding New York will just be that much lanyard, as we used to say uh, uh, in New Orleans, uh, for the Republicans and President Nixon. Uh, we can say that... Uh, that uh, I, sh I should have said a moment ago, let me correct uh, something I kind of booted around there in that fast rundown of the Senate races won. The Democrats have picked up a Senate race in Kentucky. Walter D. Huddleston defeated uh, the former Governor Louis Nunn in Kentucky, according to our CBS News estimate. A very close race there, 51% to 49, we think the final vote will be, and that takes away the Republican seat that was held by John Sherman Cooper. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. Democrats also have picked up a state house in Delaware, uh, where uh, the Republican uh, governor had retired. Uh, Democrat Sherman Tribbett 
have defeated the Republican candidate Russell Peterson. Now, by our CBS News estimate, the final figure will be 54% for Tribbett, 46% for Peterson. For a reaction now to President Nixon's uh, victory, Bruce Morton is at Senator McGovern's headquarters at the Coliseum in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Walter, I don't, uh, I don't think most of this crowd here has heard the news yet. Uh, it's taken them a long time to get in. Everyone's had to be searched by the Secret Service at the door. And uh, once in, uh, there's a lot more noise from the crowd than from the relatively few television sets uh, scattered about here. Uh, this is really more like a picnic or a church social than an election night party. From uh, the McGovern staff point of view, though, although uh, a number of them are in Washington tonight, really surprising news didn't come with uh, those early calls. They never expected to win Georgia or Alabama. Uh, the really surprising things have come in, for example, some of those big eastern and middle western states. Uh, states where McGovern really campaigned hard. He went to Illinois, I think, something like a dozen times. Uh, went to Ohio so often that uh, one man on the press plane told a Cleveland reporter once he ought to lead a story uh, for the third consecutive day George McGovern did not campaign here. He really worked those states, and he's lost those. Uh, not just lost them, but by big margins, uh, things like 60-40 splits. That uh, is the kind of thing the, uh, the campaign had not expected. They thought they'd at least run closely there. Uh, McGovern himself is... ...runner cycles, only at J.C. Penney. They have everything you're looking for, including the right price. At J.C. Penney, we know what you're looking for. Cycle. Yeah, uh, I don't know just when he will be, but uh, my colleague Bob Schieffer is at the hotel where the senator is staying. Bob? Bruce, uh, as you and I may not uh, well be aware of the uh, CBS uh, estimate declaring President uh, Nixon has won re-election. Uh, we'll find out later for sure if that's so, but it is in line with what uh, Press Secretary Dick Doherty told us earlier this evening. He said that the senator planned to eat, uh, planned to eat a steak, and then planned to take a nap through the evening. The only uh, reaction uh, by Senator McGovern came uh, somewhat earlier this evening uh, from George Cunningham, kind of an indirect uh, uh, reaction. Cunningham, his administrative assistant in the Senate office, asked uh, what his comment was. Uh, he said, what is there to say? We just have to sit and watch. He said, uh, we'll watch uh, Pennsylvania and New York. If uh, they are bad, uh, then things may be a little wicked. Very little activity actually here at the hotel. Uh, only about 100 people here. They rented a hall uh, just over the way there uh, for a celebration. Nobody in the hall. About the only activity here and the only crowd gathered here uh, gathered just right around us when the TV lights uh, were turned on and people came out to see what was going on. So that's about the situation here, Walter. Well, the uh, Senate races have just balanced out uh, with uh, our CBS News estimate from Oklahoma uh, that uh, the Republican candidate uh, there has taken uh, the seat that had been held by the retiring Senator Fred Harris, a Democrat. Uh, so the Democrats have won one Republican seat from uh, the uh, Republicans. The Republicans have won one from the Democrats. Let's get more on those Southern races now from Roger Mudd. Walter, with... Uh the Oklahoma race apparently decided it would mean that the GOP has picked up, uh, made a net gain of two Senate seats in the South. But of course, that is far short of what the Republican Party needs for control. Just looking at our southern map, we can see that uh, only one state is now out, and that is uh, Louisiana. The polls are closed there, or will be closing soon. As yet, there is no trend in Louisiana. The president has won 11 states in the South. He is leading in Arkansas. No trend from Louisiana. Roger, this, may, I, may I interrupt yes, just for a moment? To Massachusetts, another one of the big states, one uh, that it was thought uh, that Senator McGovern had a chance to win. He has indeed won. According to our VPA estimate, Senator McGovern will come out uh, in Massachusetts with about 54% of the vote to President Nixon's 46% of the vote. And that uh, is the first uh, electoral vote to drop to Senator McGovern. It also means with those 14 votes in Massachusetts that uh, the Alf Landon defeat of 1946 or 1936 will not be uh, uh, exceeded by McGovern tonight. Well, that's... Small consolation, isn't it? Because uh, for the first time since 1956, a Republican has now carried Texas. And you can't imagine 
what that means to the Republican Party. Kennedy carried it in 60, Johnson carried it in 64, and it was the only Southern state in 1968 which Hubert Humphrey carried. Those are 26 electoral votes from Texas. The president himself made two trips to Texas to visit John Conley on the uh, former Treasury Secretary's ranch, and of course Conley himself headed Democrats for Nixon. So after uh, about 15 years, Texas has again gone Republican. In the Mississippi presidential race, our vote profile analysis shows that the uh, president has won there 77 to 23. The popular vote shows the president uh, 72,000 to George McGovern's 18,000. In the Oklahoma presidential race, the winner there, President Nixon, 78% to 22%. The popular vote, 20% of it in, showing the president 181,000. That uh, is a 78% margin over George McGovern. In the North Carolina presidential race, 13 electoral votes. President Nixon there is the winner. Our vote profile analysis shows he will win by 73%. And in the Kentucky senatorial race, there the GOP has dropped a seat. Dropped it to Walter Huddleston, 515,000 to Louis Nunn's 475,000. At the last uh, week of the campaign, the president got a call for help from Louis Nunn. The president went into Ashland, but it uh, apparently has not brought uh, that much benefit to Louis Nunn. In the Virginia Senate race, incumbent Democrat William Spong has got trouble. With 34% of the vote in, he is trailing Republican William Scott by about 15,000 votes. Roger. Yes, sir. We can now put New York in President Nixon's column. 59% of the vote to McGovern's 41%. And that takes a usually solid Democratic state on the presidential races at any rate into the Republican column for the first time in a long time. We can go back to the cheering then in Washington and it will be authentic. <laughs> and uh, finally, just to clean up this uh, Southern report, in Oklahoma, as you reported earlier, the retiring Fred Harris holding a Democratic seat has uh, yielded to Ed Edmonston, who is now apparently lost to uh, Dewey Bartlett. So uh, the Southern net gain is two for the Republicans. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. Roger, how do you get those? In Arkansas, uh, the Democratic Governor Bumpers has uh, won a uh, re-election by a very handy 77% margin. We can now put Wisconsin in President Nixon's column. That was a state uh, where Senator McGovern began his drive for the nomination with his first big victory and uh, where his forces were very well organized. He had hoped that he might take Wisconsin. It's one of the states that the Republicans thought he might very well take. But he has lost it, according to a CBS News estimate, 56% to 44%. Let's take a look now at the House races. We have been able to uh, say so far that Republicans have won 39 seats and the Democrats 95. But more important is our estimate of uh, the way those races in the House will come out. And we estimate that the Republicans will win 194. Uh, that will be a pickup for the Republicans of 15 seats, but not enough to gain control of the next uh, Congress uh, in the House of Representatives. The Democrats, we estimate, will win 241 seats. Uh, the, uh, uh, and that will be enough to organize the House of Representatives by a, a very comfortable margin uh, for the Democrats. And now this, uh, this accounts for a possible 13 seats one way or the other. But even if those 13 seats all went for the Republicans, the House would still go to the Democrats according to our calculations. We can now uh, say on the basis of our sample precincts from South Dakota, that Senator McGovern has not won his home state, that President Nixon will win South Dakota when all the votes are in by 55 to 45 percent. And uh, that uh, uh, must be a blow for the Democratic candidate uh, who uh, has never lost a race in South Dakota. At Nixon headquarters in Washington Shoreham Hotel, Dan Shore and Michelle Clark, 
are with Nixon supporter Sammy Davis Jr. Yes, Walter, I guess everyone who remembers seeing the Republican convention in Miami Beach remembers a great picture of uh, Sammy Davis Jr. hugging President Nixon, who incidentally asked if you were trying to shoot him. Sammy, you have an enormous tradition of siding with the underdog, some underdog you got. <laughs> I wish I could say something appropriately clever. I'm so happy about the outcome and the mandate that the president has received from the people of America that I'm, I'm, I'm actually so jubilant about the whole thing. I have nothing smart or clever or theatrical to say. You've had a lot of criticism from some black groups. Right. Has that bothered you? Yes, of course. I think, but, you know, let me not try to sit here tonight as the total bearer of it, Daniel. Uh, all of us, all of the black celebrities got it. James Brown got it. Certainly heavier, I think, than anyone, because on a day-to-day -day basis, dealing within the black community on that day-to-day -day basis, he got, they really laid it on him. We all know where it came from. We are pretty sure where it came from. But his convictions, as well as mine, or Jim Brown's, or Will Chamberlain's, or any of the black people associated with the, with the Republican Party, uh, they were sincere convictions, and you live with those sincere convictions. What do you want him to do now for his second term? I would like for him to deal with the problems here at home as well, which I trust the president will, as he has with the diplomatic relationships with Russia and with, you know, with Red China. Meaning, I want the inner city problem solved. Some of the programs that were have been ignored or not implemented to the proper way, I, which I think he will do. I find the president, on a personal basis, a very sincere and honest man. And I know where I would like to think, no one can say I know, but I would like to think that his point of view... CBS News, election night, 72, will continue in a moment.
We can now add uh, one more of the solid South the states uh, to the uh, new solid Republican South, Louisiana, the last of the 13 southern states uh, to be reported by our CBS News estimate, and uh, President Nixon will take uh, Louisiana. All 13 of the uh, southern states have gone for President Nixon tonight, as indeed have all the other 31 states that we have uh, been able to uh, report on with the basis of our sample precincts so far. Only one state has gone for Senator McGovern. That is Massachusetts, and those 14 electoral votes uh, are the only ones in McGovern's column. South Dakota, uh, his native state, uh, he has lost, according to our CBS News estimate, and we reported that to you a moment ago. I think at the time I said that he had never lost a race in uh, South Dakota. I stand uh, corrected. I knew better, but my tongue slipped. He did lose in 1960 to Senator Munt there. And now a, another state in the Nixon column, a solidly Democratic state over the many the recent years. Rhode Island uh, has fallen to President Nixon. Uh, it'll be uh, closer there than in most of the states, 55% to 45% for uh, Senator McGovern. Also, Nebraska, which was expected to go in the Republican column, has done so again. Now, Eric Severide, we haven't had a chance to hear from you for a while. We've been so busy just uh, reporting the proportions of this landslide. Walter, I've been waiting for the arrival of my sidekick here, the author Teddy White, who uh, writes books as he runs. He's just run into this studio. Uh, Teddy, you've been with the President's party the last two or three days. I think just left them. Uh, were they um, surprised at the scope of this? I think the surprise is very moderate if it's a surprise at all. The atmosphere of that camp is one of uh, a serenity, like the uh, Yankees used to be. It's the smoothest rolling team in politics, working with the longest distance runner in politics. The highest estimate I heard in the staff yesterday and today and the day before was they might go as high as 60. I believe the president's estimate was considerably lower than that. Uh, I think if it's going over that right now, uh, they are more elated uh, than, than surprised. It's... Uh, been kind of gay today. They served Napa Valley champagne on the plane and uh, Mexican food, which, I, which I'm told the president likes. But it was uh, almost nostalgic. These people think back to 68 and the long, hard fights, and Nixon is a sportsman. I think he might have liked a tougher tussle than this, but uh, they're feeling no pain, no pain whatsoever. Well, McGovern was the candidate that Nixon really wanted to run against, wasn't he? Uh, From he way would, back. <clears throat> Yes, I think he might have liked to take a Kennedy on once and lick a Kennedy. But if he had to choose a, uh, I think you might say the Republicans and the president feel that they won their campaign at the Democratic National Convention. For sure. The president, I'm told, is completely devoid of bitterness this evening as he should be. But you can find some of the people on that staff, and especially over this weekend, who have been extremely bitter at McGovern on the... I want to ask you about that, this peace issue, whether it's a phony peace uh, in sight or not. Uh, McGovern's called the president a liar, in effect. Well, that, that, has, that has angered the staff enormously. That staff is absolutely confident. And you can't be with them for two days without sharing their confidence that peace is actually at hand. Uh, the, they believe that McGovern knows this. They believe McGovern is fully aware of what's going on and that if there's any fraud anywhere, it's been fraud on McGovern's side. That, as I point out, as I understand it, the president himself does not share this bitterness. He feels like a, oh, a man who has won by a million miles and is way above bitterness. But the others are more in a combat mood still. Teddy, we're getting apparently a pretty big turnout of voters this time. Uh, and a lot of people thought there was, you know, the usual apathy line. Uh, what do you think it was? Just the quietness, people being reserved, but fully intending to vote all the time? I think the this campaign has deeply stirred the American people. You have to get back to some very old-fashioned words to understand it. And the old-fashioned words work for Mr. Nixon. Uh, I, I know we hate to use a word like uh, patriotism on air. I know we hate to use a word like duty on air. But I think they were much more deeply disturbed by the axis, the thrust of the McGovern campaign, particularly on defense and on amnesty, then they were stirred the other way by the Watergate scandal. It, it, it's, I think it twinged some emotions in America, which 
which we felt have not been there for a long time and which come alive to me with a great deal of uh, surprise. Yeah, they are there. It looks very much, Teddy, uh, you know, when a man, uh, Mr. Nixon, who's not always been very popular, uh, wins this big, and when he puts the challenger on the defensive, you know you've got something very different a profound weakness in the challenging party this time. This is at least half the equation. I think I have to give it back to Walter over there now, if I may. Thank you, Teddy White. We have uh, a, a CBS News estimate on that Senate race in Virginia uh, where it was thought that the Democratic incumbent might be in a little bit of trouble with a uh, Nixon uh, victory in the state, but uh, uh, and it appears that indeed he was. Uh, Republican Scott has won the Virginia Senate race, 52% of the vote, uh, to upset uh, the incumbent, uh, Spong. Uh, we'll get more on that in a little while from Roger Mudd. But uh, that now means that the uh, Republicans have picked up two Senate seats in the South. Uh, they pick, uh, and uh, they picked up actually three Senate seats in the South. Uh, the Democrats had picked up one uh, and in the South. And uh, with that, uh, it means a net gain for the Republicans in the South of two uh, Senate seats. They need a net gain of five Senate seats uh, to win control of the Senate. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. With uh, some 33 of the states uh, now in our columns uh, on which CBS News can estimate winners, 33 of them for President Nixon, it would appear that he is well on the way to very possibly the second greatest electoral vote to landslide in our history, second only to that of Roosevelt over Landon in 1936. And now let's get some of the tales from our eastern races from Mike Wallace. Walter, if there's any graphic understanding of what has happened to President Nixon tonight, let's go to Rhode Island to begin with. That's the most democratic state of all in the last three elections. John Kennedy won over Richard Nixon with 64% of the vote in 1960. Lyndon Johnson beat Barry Goldwater with 81% of the vote. Hubert Humphrey won over Richard Nixon with 64% of the vote. George Wallace taking 4%. And this time, the president has turned it around 55 to 45. Now, we're talking about the most Catholic state in the country. Two-thirds of Rhode Island is Catholic. Two-thirds working class. One half of the population of Rhode Island over 25 didn't finish high school. No Republican senator has been elected here since 1930, and incidentally, on the issue of coattails, at this moment, Claiborne Pell, the incumbent Democrat, is leading John Chafee uh, by 54 to 46. Pell leading Chafee, 54 to 46, in the state of Rhode Island. But to come back to the uh, original thesis, Rhode Island is an indication of how Catholics have moved toward President Nixon, how the working class, how blue-collar people have moved toward Nixon, and now we have confirmation. Claiborne Pell has won the Rhode Island Senate race with about 54% of the vote. John Chafee, three-time governor of that state, former secretary of the Navy, Nixon's coattails made no difference to John Chafee. Pell has returned to the Senate. But let's take a look, while we have time anyway, at some of the other races in the East. Let's recapitulate some of the CBS News estimates, beginning with the state of New York, and compare where Richard Nixon is this time compared to last time. Let's start with New York State. 59% for the president this time. Last time around, he had 45%. Let's move to Massachusetts. This time, 45%. Last time, 33%. Of course, McGovern won in Massachusetts. And last time, George Wallace had 4%. In the state of Connecticut, 60% in that blue-collar, ethnic, Catholic state this time. Last time around, 44% for Richard Nixon. He won in Delaware last time with 45% of the vote. This time, up to 61% of the vote. And so it goes all through the eastern states doubling his Catholic vote from last time, doubling the Jewish vote as well, or just about, in spite of the fact that the Jews still predominantly went to McGovern. This, obviously, is the, is the win that Richard Nixon wanted more than any other. Barry Goldwater had suggested he was going to saw off the eastern seaboard and send it out to sea. Richard Nixon has brought it back into the Republican Party. The percentage, the popular percentage for President Nixon has dropped a little bit. Now with one-fifth of the nation's vote counted, he's down to 64%. It was up to 67 at one time earlier this evening. Mr. Earl, 
Seligman, what about some of the other domestic issues? Welfare reform, is there going to be a new plan? Will it be the same old plan? Are you going to push harder for it this time than last time? Well, we pushed hard last time, but I think uh, an awful lot of the uh, congressmen have been campaigning on the welfare issue, and they've taken positions. You know, nobody was really thinking about welfare reform until the president advanced the proposal three years ago. Now it's an issue. It's a national issue, and I think there have been a lot of positions crystallized by candidates for the Senate and the Congress. Very, sorry, very briefly, Mr. Ehrlich. I mean, there are some who say that you could have had welfare reform if you'd be willing to make a deal, perhaps at the cost of a few votes, with Senator Ripikoff and the Democratic liberals. Is that so? No, I don't believe that. I know uh, uh, I watched your show, and that was the implication of the CBS show, but, but I don't think it's true. Uh, Senator Ribicoff didn't have the votes, and we were very near the end of a session. Uh, the conservatives in the Senate had it within their power to filibuster right up against the, the adjournment date. And uh, as we counted it, we simply had a third, a third, a third, and it was just about deadlocked. Thank you, Mr. Ehrlich. Walter, in the uh, South, uh, in, uh, in uh, Mississippi, Senator Jim Eastland has uh, won his race for re-election uh, over uh, Carmichael, uh, the Republican challenger. Uh, he won by, uh, we'll fi we figure, to be about 57 to 41 percent. Uh, in Arkansas, Senator McClellan, uh, the Democrat, uh, won again handily as expected. And also in Louisiana, Democrat uh, uh, J. Bennett Johnston has won in the Senate as expected. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. We have a uh, CBS News estimate on uh, what had been anticipated to be a very close uh, Senate race in uh, New Mexico. And there, the Republican candidate, <coughs> Domenici, has uh, defeated the Democratic candidate, Jack Daniels, which means another seat that the Republicans have taken from the Democrats. That seat had been occupied by Clinton Anderson, a 24-year veteran in the uh, Senate uh, who retired this year. And with uh, that Republican uh, victory, they now have picked up four seats of the five they need to gain control of the Senate. Of course, a lot of states have not been heard from yet, but uh, they are moving close to at least one of the coattail objectives of campaign 72. The, uh, the race has won so far in the, the, uh, in the Senate. We could go through those very quickly for you. The uh, Republicans have won 11 races and the Democrats eight. The Republicans have won, as expected, uh, uh, holding on to their uh, seats uh, that they now occupy in uh, Massachusetts, in New Jersey, uh, in uh, in South Carolina, in Tennessee, and in Texas, in Illinois, and in uh, Kansas. However, they have won Democratic seats in North Carolina, Oklahoma, Virginia, uh, before the announcement we just had for you in New Mexico. So they have picked up four seats so far. The Democrats have picked up one seat, so the margin should be three, I suppose, of the seats that the, Senate, that the Republicans have picked up so far. The Democrats have won a very close race in Rhode Island, in West Virginia, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And now let's go for a more complete report from our Middle Western states and Dan Rather. Well, Walter, uh, as you can see by the map, the Nixon forces have uh, marched through the breadbasket Midwest uh, like a combine, and it says things now start and only Minnesota, that's the only state standing between Richard Nixon and a complete sweep of the Midwest, meaning that uh, if George McGovern cannot take Minnesota in the Midwest, that uh, it will be the solid Midwest added to the solid South. Uh, a couple of very interesting Senate races uh, building up, but first just to give you an idea of uh, how much the president is winning by in the Midwest and how short his coattails in this particular area of the country are proving to be, uh, take a look, hold it, just something has, this is uh, an upset of the first order here in Iowa, which is about as Republican as uh, you can get. CBS News estimates that the Democrat, Clark, has upset Jack Miller, the Republican, and that Clark's final winning margin will be on the order of 56%. Now, Walter, this could be, turn out to be the most interesting uh, story of the night, uh, other than the size of President Nixon's landslide because the Democrat Clark in Iowa was the administrative assistant to Congressman John Culver. Culver, a Democratic congressman in Iowa, was all set to run against Jack Miller. His own polls told him, though, that in the face of a Nixon landslide that he, a Democrat, and I would have no chance. His administrative assistant refused to believe the polls, went out to Iowa, and if our CBS News estimate is correct, 
has done uh, what his own congressman uh, for whom he worked uh, was unwilling to even try. Uh, I'd have to judge uh, that that's the upset of the evening thus far. Jack Miller, incumbent Republican senator in, uh, in Iowa, uh, losing on the basis of our CBS uh, estimate. CBS uh, News estimates that Clark has won, and I keep repeating it because it's very hard to believe, but we talked to a Republican senator uh, from out west uh, a few minutes ago, and he said, you know, given the size of President Nixon's winning margin, his coattails just about everywhere are surprisingly uh, small, and it's going to be difficult, says this Republican, to go to Lincoln Day dinners and explain how the president could win by such a wide margin, but the Republican uh, uh, minorities in the House and Senate uh, continue to exist. Well, once over that upset of uh, Jack Miller losing uh, in Iowa, Let's go back to our boards and take a look at Michigan, where there's another tight Senate race and another possible upset there, although it would not be uh, quite as great. In Michigan, which uh, has already uh, gone to President Nixon in the Senate race there, Senator Robert Griffin, Republican trying uh, for a second term, with 15% of the precincts uh, reporting and the vote in and tabulated, uh, the Griffin is out front. Our CBS News estimate on the Senate race uh, in Michigan is that Griffin uh, is running ahead by about 54%. But uh, we have very few reports from the Detroit area where they've had a lot of voting machine trouble and a heavy vote turnout. And this race could be, still be very, very close. Uh, it is by no means decided. In South Dakota, in the Senate race in uh, South Dakota, another race that was expected to be very, very close. This was the race between uh, the Republican Robert Hirsch and uh, the only Lebanese Rosebud Indian running for the Senate anywhere here or elsewhere, Aberesk. Uh, in, with 3% of the precincts in, it uh, shapes up as an extremely close race. Uh, as you may have heard earlier, uh, Senator McGovern has lost his home state, but Aberesk, the Democrat there, trying for that Senate seat, uh, would appear to have a, a, at least a decent chance at this hour of running a... Also went for President Nixon by a large margin, a 64, and we're still on New Mexico. You can look. All right, we'll do New Mexico Senate. We'll look at the Senate race there where Pete Domenici uh, picked up the Democratic seat left by uh, Clinton Anderson, who retired this year. In that race, Domenici, Walter, was backed by President Nixon's former image maker, uh, whom you read about in the selling of the uh, President Harry Trelevin and his opponent Jack Daniels was supported by Hubert Humphrey's old image maker Joe Napolitan. Uh, after Pete Domenici lost the governor's race two years ago, uh, he took a little image poll and found out he looked a little young and too neat, so he added 22 pounds and rumpled himself a little bit. Jack Daniels, who's known as the Broderick Crawford of New Mexico politics, uh, looked at his uh, photographs and had them airbrushed so that his jowls didn't come out so much. So uh, if you judge it that way, I guess you can say New Mexico uh, likes some beef on its candidates. Nevada went for President Nixon tonight by 62 to 38 percent, according to the CBS estimate. This uh, bravo doesn't mean much, of course. In Utah, again for President Nixon, as it did last time. And there's an interesting thing in Utah. If we can go to the Utah CBS Estimate Board, after we look at these uh, very sparse popular votes, here's President Nixon winning Utah by 75 to 25 percent. However, in the Utah governor's race, we have incumbent Democratic Governor Calvin Rampton winning by almost exactly the same percentage which is an opposite situation, and you certainly can't call that any coattails. Wyoming also went to uh, President Nixon tonight, as it did in 1960 and 1968. So, Walter, the West is uh, holding solid with the rest of the country and keeping some of the high percentages for the president. Election night 72 will continue in a moment. In this Nixon landslide year, the only state that Senator McGovern has won is in Massachusetts in the east, and that's Mike Wallace's area, Mike. Walter, there are two Senate races in the east that are as close as any races any place across the country, and both of them, each of them, could be a huge upset if the Democrat were to win. Let's take a look, first of all, at the state of Maine, the Senate race. 29% of that vote is in now, and as you can see, William Hathaway, the Democrat, 22,600. 
over Senator Margaret Chase Smith, 20,866. And it's, there's no trend. CBS News just cannot estimate how that race is going to come out. Now, Margaret Chase Smith is 74 years old. She's going after her fifth term in the Senate. Bill Hathaway was a congressman, Democratic congressman, who gave up his seat because he thought that uh, Ed Muskie was going to be at the head of the ticket and he'd ride in on Muskie's coattails. Muskie didn't ride into the uh, nomination and Hathaway was given up for dead. But in the last month or two, Hathaway has come along very, very fast. Just within the last month, he pulled even and in some polls ahead. He's 48 years old. He has campaigned vigorously in just about every community all across the state of Maine. Margaret Chase Smith took Maine for granted, a good many people said. Some of the newspapers felt that she'd been aloof, inaccessible. Just Sunday night, the two of them had a debate. It was suggested that perhaps Hathaway had won the debate. Margaret Chase Smith was turned down in an editorial by the newspaper that she used to work for up there. And uh, at this moment, it's been going back and forth, back and forth all night for a while. We had the Democrat leading. Now there's no trend there. In Delaware, Joseph Biden, 29-year-old challenger of Senator Caleb Boggs. Boggs, 63 years old. He's been governor. He's been senator going for his third term. He's had four terms in the House of Representatives. He's been everything. Mr. Delaware. Joseph Biden, 29 years old. He's had two years as new... Castle County Councilman, and he has been a vigorous young challenger. It's the same story in Delaware, much the same story as in Maine. Boggs aloof. It's suggested he's been a rubber stamp for Richard Nixon. Biden said it's time that we had somebody who'll yell in Washington about taxes and ecology and so forth, and that one also. Too close to call with 76% of the vote in. If either or both of those should go to the Democrats, you can understand that not only would not the Republicans pick up the five they need, I guess they'd be back to just about even, Walter. We're told that uh, President Nixon uh, has not been watching the returns tonight, but has been receiving them from his uh, aide, H.R. Haldeman, and reporting them to him as they come to the uh, White House by television and some telephone reports from Republican headquarters. The president himself uh, is in his study by a roaring fireplace, uh, his briefcase at his side, and uh, a large yellow legal pad on his knee as he drafts his victory statement to report to us from uh, Washington. Incidentally, uh, uh, his former Treasury Secretary. Crowd here, uh, 1,500 or 2,000 people uh, cheering and yelling just as if this evening had all never happened and uh, the votes were still to be cast. Uh, the senator himself smiling. Uh, he had a nap earlier this evening, we're told. And he's uh, said that calm these recent days about it all. Uh, said once or twice, uh, whatever happens, I'll still be a United States senator. Uh, said also that he would not run again for the presidency. None of that is on the minds of this crowd. Hands are in the air. Uh, peace signs, victory signs, uh, sometimes just flailing balloons. And uh, for all the world, you'd think you'd won. Uh, this has been a quiet party up until now. Uh, but this has ignited it. This is the kind of good crowd that we saw all during the campaign. Those of us who traveled with him were puzzled sometimes. The crowd seems so good and the poll seems so bad for him. Uh, this is the We Want George chant that we've heard a lot of uh, these last couple of months. This has been a physically tiring two months for George McGovern. Uh, although we've said these last few days, uh, his strength has got to come back to him. Uh, his voice, which started to go with about a week's campaigning left, uh, has returned. That's the uh, kind of crowd quieting line we all got used to this fall. That's George McGovern. Thank you very much. You'll notice it hasn't quieted them this time, but uh, it is what it says.
Thank you very much. <laughs> right. right here among my friends in South Dakota, where this campaign began almost 22 months ago. It's But uh, we, now, we now bring it to an end tonight, and I have just sent the following telegram to President Nixon. Congratulations on your victory. I hope that in the next four years, you will lead us to a time of peace abroad and justice at home. You have my full support in such efforts. With best wishes to you and your gracious wife, Pat. Sincerely, George McGovern. The first, uh, the first presidential concession that I remember hearing was that of Adley Stevenson in 1952. He recalled the old Lincoln story of the boy who had stubbed his toe in the dark, and when the lad was asked how it felt, he replied, well, it hurts too much to laugh, but I'm too old to cry. It does, it, does, uh, it does hurt all of us in this auditorium and many others across the country to lose, but we're not going to shed any tears tonight about the great joys that this campaign has brought to us over the past two years. All of the satisfaction and joy that we have found in these past 22 months are not going to be washed away with the tears and regrets of one night. We have... CBS News now estimates that uh, Nixon also has won California. The greatest outpouring of energy and love that any political effort has ever inspired, at least in my lifetime. Eleanor and I and our family, along with Sergeant and Eunice Shriver, will never forget the people of this campaign. And those... We, uh, we will never forget those that we have seen in countless meeting places all across this country, those we knew about on the telephone and on their feet who have worked so hard, so terribly hard, for all these many, many long months. The poet Yates said something that I quoted the night of the Massachusetts primary, and it looks like Massachusetts is coming through again tonight. Yates said, count where man's glory most begins and ends, and say my glory was I had such friends. And that's the way I feel tonight. Now, the presidency uh, belongs to someone else, but the glory of these devoted working friends and their dedication to the noble ideals of this country sustains us now, and it will sustain our country. We will shed no tears because all of this effort, I am positive, will bear fruit for years to come. There can be no question at all that we have pushed this country in the direction of peace, and I think each one of us loves the title of peacemaker more than any office in the land. And 
Ukraine. We will, we will press on with that effort until all the bloodshed and all the sorrow have ended once and for all. I, I want every single one of you to remember and never forget it that if we pushed the day of peace just one day closer, then every minute and every hour and every bone-crushing effort in this campaign was worth the entire sacrifice. into the political process those who never before have experienced either its joy or its sorrows, then that too is an enduring blessing. Now the question is, to what standard does the loyal opposition now rally? We do not rally to the support of policies that we deplore. But we do love this country, and we will continue to beckon it to a higher standard. So I ask all of you tonight to stand with your convictions. I ask you not to despair of the political process of this country, because that process has yielded to much valuable improvement in these past two years. The Democratic Party will be a better party because of the reforms that we have carried out. The nation will be better because we never once gave up the long battle to renew its oldest ideals and to redirect its current energies along more humane and hopeful paths. So let us play the proper role of the loyal opposition and let us play it in those familiar words from Isaiah that I've quoted so frequently, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God bless you. Good night. So, Senator McGovern's campaign that began 22 months ago as he sought the presidency, in which he has traveled over 200,000 miles, 96,000 miles since the convention itself, more than any other candidate in history, which he spent more than $40 million, comes to an end. The 50-year-old senator from South Dakota has two more years of his present term in the Senate, and then he must stand for re-election in South Dakota if that is his choice for his political future. Uh, the immediate future is what role he will play in the uh, Democratic Party. A National Democratic Committee meeting in Washington on December the 9th uh, will very likely decide the immediate future of the party that went down to an historic defeat tonight. CBS News coverage of election night 7 will continue in a moment. Our CBS News estimates on those Western races are beginning to pour in now, and John Hart has several of them for us. Well, the president has won uh, 10 seats of uh, 10 uh, states of the 13 in the West, all but uh, Alaska, Arizona, and Hawaii. He's won in Colorado, Idaho, uh, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Wyoming, and now, as you said a little earlier, in California, which is the one large state uh, after Massachusetts that uh, Senator McGovern thought he had a good shot at. The uh, Nixon people worked very hard there to uh, better the McGovern canvassing effort that was so successful during the primaries, and apparently they were successful, California going for Richard Nixon. 
Washington State went for Richard Nixon as well. This is one of the two states in the West that the president did not win in 1968. And it shows, uh, at least our estimate is, that the president will win by 59 to 41 percent in Washington. In Oregon, a state that uh, went for Richard Nixon in 1968, went for him again in 1972 by a margin of 10 percentage points. And by the same margin, Mark Hatfield, the incumbent uh, senator from Oregon, the Republican who once predicted that President Nixon might be dumped in 1972, has uh, won and is challenged by Wayne Morse, the four-term Democrat who wanted to come back to the Senate. Mark Hatfield is the one who ran on the slogan, we can't afford to lose him, and apparently Oregon agreed. Over in Wyoming, there's another Senate race uh, that went to the Republicans, or that was kept by the Republicans. Cliff Hansen uh, beating off a uh, weak challenge from bar owner Mike Vinich of Hudson, Wyoming. Hansen spending about $200,000, Walter, on that race, and the last we heard from Mike Vinich, he had $2,000 to spend. I guess it just wasn't enough. Uh, return from Colorado on that uh, referendum out there regarding the Olympics. Colorado voters have cut off all funds for the 1976 Winter Olympics, and uh, the International Olympic Committee, it is believed, cannot possibly hold the games there without the state funds, without which there wouldn't be matching federal funds either. So the Winter Olympics of 1976 are apparently not going to be in Colorado. They're going to have to be moved. Well, there was some talk, you know, that uh, some private parties who were interested uh, in bringing the Olympics there, some businessmen, might try and raise that much money, but uh, it's going to be hard to raise enough to get the federal government to match that. Yeah, well, that's that's the point. And it, uh, apparently uh, the, the general consideration of the Olympic Committee and some others is that it just can't be done yeah. without the full wholehearted support backed by money, which is, is the only way you can really tell whether you've got wholehearted support or not, I guess, in anything uh, for the Olympic Games. CBS News now can say on the basis of our sample precincts that Senator Margaret Chase Smith of Maine has been defeated uh, this year, uh, despite the Republican landslide uh, across this United States and uh, in Maine itself on the in the presidential column, uh, Margaret Chase Smith uh, has uh, lost. Uh, our CBS News estimate is that when all the votes are in, it will be a 55 to 45 percent margin uh, for uh, the Democrat candidate Hathaway. And Mike Wallace will give us all the details on that in just a moment. This now brings the Senate uh, uh, net gain for Republicans or Democrats to zero. Uh, they each have picked up five seats from the other, and uh, the, that means that uh, the Senate will be uh, in about the same composition, although with some new faces, uh, in uh, 1973 when it meets again in uh, January. Uh, the totals now, as you see, are 15 Senate races. Uh, the Republicans have won, 13 the Democrats have won. That's a total of 28, so there are five outstanding races, and most of those are uh, Republican seats anyway. The, uh, uh, in the House, uh, the situation is about the same according to our news estimate. The uh, Republicans will win some seats there, perhaps as many as 16 or 17 seats, uh, but uh, they're not, that's not enough. Uh, they need 39 to gain control of the House of Representatives, so it appears that uh, President Nixon will again have a Democratic Congress. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. I first want to express my deep appreciation to every one of you, the millions of you who gave me your support in the election today. And I want to express my respect for millions of others who gave their support to Senator McGovern. I know that after a campaign, when one loses, he can feel very, very low, and his supporters as well may feel that way. And when he wins, as you will note when I get over to the Sharm, people are feeling very much better. The important thing in our process, however, is to play the game. And in the great game of life, and particularly the game of politics, what is important is that on either side, more Americans voted this year than ever before. And the fact that you won or you lost must not keep you from keeping in the great game of politics in the years ahead, because the better competition we have between the two parties, 
between the two men running for office, whatever office that may be, means that we get the better people and the better programs for our country. And now that the election is over, it is time to get on with the great tasks that lie before us. I've tried to conduct myself in this campaign in a way that would not divide our country, not divide it regionally or by parties or in any other way. Because I very firmly believe that what unites America today is infinitely more important than those things which divide us. We are united, Americans, North, East, West, and South, both parties, in our desire for peace. Peace with honor, the kind of a peace that will last. And we are moving swiftly toward that great goal, not just in Vietnam, but a new era of peace in which the old relationships between the two superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States, and between the world's most populous nation, the People's Republic of China, in the United States are changed so that we are on the eve of what could be the greatest generation of peace, true peace for the whole world that man has ever known. This is a great goal, bigger than whether we're Democrats or Republicans. And it's one that I think you will want to work with me, with all of us, in helping to achieve. There are other goals that go with that. The prosperity without war and without inflation that we have all wanted and that we now can have. And the progress for all Americans, the kind of progress so that we can say to any young American, whatever his background, that he or she in this great country has an equal chance to go to the top in whatever field he or she may choose. I have noted in listening to the returns a few minutes ago that several commentators have reflected on the fact that this may be one of the great political victories of all time. In terms of votes, that may be true. But in terms of what a victory really is, a huge landslide margin means nothing at all unless it is a victory for America. It will be a victory for America, only if in these next four years, we, all of us, can work together to achieve our common great goals of peace at home and peace for all nations in the world, and for that new progress and prosperity which all Americans deserve. I would only hope that in these next four years, we can so conduct ourselves in this country and so meet our responsibilities in the world, in building peace in the world, that years from now, people will look back to the generation of the 1970s at how we've conducted ourselves. And they will say, God bless America. Thank you very much. President Nixon uh, will be going on to the uh, Shoreham Hotel uh, where the Victory Party is underway and Vice President Agnew is expected to uh, join him there uh, that uh, very shortly. Thus the 59-year-old president uh, completes his last political campaign, presumably. Uh, he uh, it is, marks a remarkable uh, comeback from uh, the depths of political despair. Just 10 years ago tonight, turns out that President Nixon, or the then uh, Vice President Nixon, no, he wasn't even Vice President then. He'd been defeated for the presidency in 60. 1962, he appeared in a uh, ballroom of a Los Angeles hotel uh, to concede defeat and the governorship race in California. And it was at that time that he said he wouldn't be running for office again. He told the newsmen, as you remember in that statement, that uh, they wouldn't have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore. 
But in just 10 years since then, he has come back to tonight uh, win uh, one of the greatest landslide victories in the history of this nation. It may turn out to be the greatest landslide victory. Remarkably enough, he did that by traveling more in 1966 to elect uh, governors and congressmen and senators and to build up a, a group of political IOUs for the 1968 race, travel more by almost uh, twice as he did this year in his re-election campaign. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. This has to be a tremendously satisfying evening for all of you who've worked so hard to re-elect our great president. Just as it has to be a very satisfying evening for workers all over the country who were active in the re-elect effort, and for those who work so arduously for the candidates of their choice. It's wonderful to have a winner in politics. But I would say that whether one wins or one loses, there is much to be learned out of the political effort and in the political arena. One of the things that satisfies me most about this election is the chance that I've had to be associated with a great president, a president whose policies have been put before the American people, a president who the better he is known by the American people, the more he is loved by the American people. And it's just wonderfully satisfying, I'm sure, for our president to recognize that while he won in 1968, he won on faith. He won on the fact that he had made certain commitments to the American people. But in 1972, he won not on faith, he won on performance. He won on the fact that he performed those commitments. Now, I heard President Nixon on the tube just a few minutes ago, and I heard him say something that I thought was very significant and very important to us all. He said that no matter whether this victory is one of an unprecedented margin or not, it is not a satisfying victory unless it is a victory for the American people. That is the kind of attitude that a president must bring to his office if this country is to be united. I want to express my personal appreciation to everyone who has worked so hard in this campaign, to the members of my family who have suffered through so much political activity, and believe me, political families at campaign time have to give up a little of the ordinary way of life. But they have enjoyed it, too, and the result is gratifying. I also want to say to all the candidates who won, whatever party they represent, that they have one of the most precious things that representatives of a free people can have. They have the unchallenged approval of the majority of their constituencies. They don't have to rely on any kind of police power for their mandate, because in our country, the right to govern comes directly from the people. And they have won it. But in winning, of course, they must reach out the hand of conciliation to those who have voted for someone else in good conscience, in good faith. For myself, I can only say that I hope that the performance of the Nixon-Agnew administration in the next four years 
will satisfy not only those who supported the ticket this year, but those who didn't. I hope that we will all unite behind one of the strongest, one of the most temperate, courageous leaders of our time, President Nixon. And now the, the big moment that we've all been awaiting is almost here. The President has left the Oval, Oval Office with the members of the First Family and is on his way to this hall. And in the meantime, let me simply say, enjoy and savor what you worked for and won. Thank you. President Nixon, who has just presented Vice President Agnew, although the Vice President has spoken a few minutes ago. This is a moment for history, and the President is in no hurry to speak. He's already spoken from the White House, and now to the loyal workers who supported him through this campaign, he wants them to Mr. savor Vice, the moment. Mr. Vice President, Mrs. Agnew, all of our very distinguished guests here at the Shore Motel and the very distinguished audience listening on television and radio. At Ontario, California on Saturday night, at the conclusion of a speech to what was estimated a crowd of 50,000, I said, this is the last time I will ever be addressing a campaign rally as a candidate. It may be that that was the last campaign rally as a candidate, but this means tonight we still have a rally right here. Now let me briefly touch upon several significant things about this election. First, and uh, this, for me, is rather unusual. I've never known a national election when I would be able to go to bed earlier than tonight. <laughs> Second, I want to say here to this great audience and to all of those who will be listening on television and radio that I know from having been a candidate for vice president and a vice president for eight years, that this is always a team campaigning for office. I want you to know that during the period of the last several weeks since the convention, when I've had to be in Washington for reasons that all of you could well understand, that I watched the vice president as he carried the major burden of campaigning. I. I watched, I watched with no concern and considerable amusement uh, the attempts that were being made by some uh, rather, rather vicious uh, heckling uh, to get under his skin and get him to blow his cool. Let me say, <laughs> the, real, the real test of a campaigner is to go through the fire of a campaign when he's taken all the heat. The vice president has proved he's a great campaigner. I was going to say he can, he can take it and he can dish it out too.
also would like to pay tribute to all of the other members of the team. I refer, of course, to our campaign chairman, Clark McGregor, to John Mitchell, John Mitchell, his predecessor, to Maury Stans, our finance chairman, to all of the members of the cabinet team who did such a magnificent job traveling through this country, to representatives from the Congress, the House, the Senate, and the national administration who carried the story that we wanted to tell throughout the land. They were a great team. I think they've been a great team over the past four years, and in this campaign, when you add up those states to what has been called a rather significant victory, they get a great deal of the credit, I can assure you. I also want to pay tribute to another group that too often is overlooked. I wrote a book after the election defeat of 1960, and one of the chapters of that book dealt with the campaign of 1960. When you write a book, you're supposed to dedicate it to somebody. And not being an expert at this sort of thing, uh, I just put on the flyleaf of the dedication page in this book about the campaign of 1960. I dedicated it to Pat. She also ran. <laughs> you to know tonight how very grateful we should be to the wives of our cabinet members, to the distaff members, as sometimes I guess we can still call them that in these days, and you're supposed to be very careful about how you describe people. But in any event, <laughs> at least, shall we say, to our first ladies, and they are always our first ladies in our own families. Uh, I'm simply very, very proud of all of them. I can summarize how I feel about all of our campaign in this way. Our speakers throughout campaigned hard. Our speakers throughout campaigned clean. They campaigned on the issues, and I'm proud of the campaign they put on, and it showed in the results. Something else was new in this campaign. All of us know, of course, about those young voters. And uh, I recall at the convention that uh, we were told by some of the enthusiasts there on our convention that the predictions were wrong, that because of the overwhelming youth vote that was going to go against us, that we had a very, very hard road to hoe if we were to win this election. Let me say, based on the results I have seen today, we have accomplished what was thought to be the impossible. We've not only won a majority of the votes of America, but we've won a majority of the votes of young Americans. you should know that the one who stands in this position with four years ahead must think of what he wants for those four years, and we want, of course, many things. We want to do the very best job we can for all the country, for all people in our society. We want to have in mind, too, the fact that in this election, it was very unusual in another respect 
it was not region against region. It was not one age group against another age group. It was not party against party. I think we can be proud of the fact that as we look at our majority, which is a very large majority, it comes from all of America. Let us remember that in these next four years, we're not going to work for one group against another. We are dedicated to work for all Americans to make this a greater country. To those millions of Democrats and independents who supported us, as well as, of course, to the Republicans who supported us in overwhelming numbers, they have, you have, our deep appreciation. To all those who work so hard, our appreciation. I'll never be able to thank all of you personally, not even get all the letters out that I would like. But I know what you did, and I know how much you contributed. I would simply like to leave one final thought with you, perhaps in a personal sense. No one knows before the votes are counted how it's going to come out. No one really would have predicted after our convention uh, that we were going to win this kind of a victory. And now at the present time, I notice some of the commentators are referring to the fact that it may be the greatest victory in American political history. Let me tell you... I have two reactions to that. Of course, it's great on election night to think that we've won a victory, but this will be a great victory depending upon what we do with it. In other words, we win elections not simply for the purpose of beating the other party or the other person, but to get the opportunity to do good things for our country. And the next four years will be the time that we will try to make ourselves worthy of this victory. I will simply say, in that connection, it was a great victory. But the greater the victory, the greater the responsibility, the greater the opportunity. And we're going to try to meet it, dedicating ourselves to those great goals that I have discussed at such great length throughout this campaign and will in the next four years, building that world of peace, of real peace with honor throughout the world, and building at home, not only peace at home, but the new prosperity and the progress for all Americans that is so close to our hearts. And finally, on that personal note, about 30 days ago, uh, when I was sitting in the Lincoln sitting room late at night trying to get some materials ready for a National Security Council meeting the next morning, Tricia dropped into the room around 10.30 or 11. She was going out to dedicate a, a uh, dam or something at a non-political... <laughs> non-political affair. <laughs> and uh, she was asking me, she was trying to get some suggestions about remarks, and uh, I find that whenever I make suggestions of remarks to Trisha or Julie or Eddie Cox, uh, they always can do better without any suggestions. But I made a couple. And then before she left the room, she turned and said, uh, you know, Daddy, did you ever stop to think that this is your last campaign? And I said, yes, I have. And as I think of what she said that night, I simply want to say from the bottom of my heart, thanks for making our last campaign the very best one of all. Thank you.
President Nixon and Vice President Agnew speaking to the assembled Republicans celebrating their landslide victory at the Shoreham Hotel in Washington, D.C. Jeff Williams is with the Minnesota Senators Humphrey and Walter Mondale, who won his bid for re-election tonight. Come in, uh, Jeff, the Senators. Well, Walter, one of the bright spots for the Democrats tonight has to be here, where Senator Walter Mondale has won another term, another uh, re-election here. And a curious note is, 24 years ago, he was working for Senator Humphrey. And tonight, Senator Humphrey, who is here and one of his strongest supporters, said Senator Mondale may go to the very top, to the White House. Senator Mondale, the, uh, Richard Nixon was not able to carry in a Republican Senate on his coattails tonight. Do you foresee any confrontations between the Senate and the President coming up in the next four years, particularly over Vietnam? Well, I, if the war doesn't end, very definitely there will be a confrontation. We want that war over. We hope the President wants it over. Uh, that's one of the unresolved questions at the time of the election. But that ought to be number one on everyone's agenda to end that war. But I would say it's uh, that most of us feel that the Senate should be with the president when he's right and oppose him when we think he's wrong. I don't think that uh, when we have divided government like this that it uh, either serves the national interest or anybody's political interest just to be negative. Senator Humphrey is one of the senior men in the party now. What trends do you foresee in the Democratic Party? What new directions after Senator McGovern's rather heavy defeat? Well, I uh, would like to just personalize it for a moment. Uh, I see here in Senator Mondale the kind of politics and personality that is able to bring together the forces that are necessary for victory. If you could look around this room, you see uh, literally hundreds of young people, strong McGovern supporters. You see the party regulars, our friends from organized labor, the senior citizens, our farm people. They're here. And they all voted for Senator Mondale. I mean, overwhelmingly, uh, uh, Senator Mondale just didn't win a victory out here. That's one thing. He has over 60% of the vote right now. And uh, I think that's an amazing victory. And on top of that, uh, we've come through with legislative victories in the state of Minnesota and others. Uh, so uh, when you say, what does it take uh, to put the party back on the victory trail, uh, I think the best way to tell you is that it takes a man like Fritz Mondale, my colleague here, somebody that uh, doesn't uh, go too far one way, but is yet a man of great idealism, and it also has a record, a legislative record. I should say that one of the legislators who got elected was Hubert's son. We got another Humphrey in Minnesota now, a state senator. Yes, and I'm mighty happy. I'm mighty happy. Senator, yes. uh, I was just wondering uh, about the uh, leadership of the Democratic Party now uh, that uh, have suffered tonight uh, a defeat of landslide proportions. The Democratic National Committee has been considerably reorganized under the so-called McGovern reforms. There are some 304 members of the committee instead of 110 now. Uh, it generally conceded that uh, McGovernites in that committee uh, may total around 40 percent of the committee with uh, kind of a swing vote there of old uh, Muskie supporters. Uh, where do you think the party will go? Who will lead the party uh, out of uh, the depths of the despair of 72 now? Well, uh, I think we'll have to look to uh, men like uh, Senator Mondale here and uh, Ted Kennedy and others that are leaders in the Congress. Uh, I don't want to um, advocate any great purge. I think that would be wrong. There are lots of people here that were what you call McGovernites that have worked very hard, have done a good job. They become uh, active party people. They are, are Democrats. Now, uh, we've got to make sure that uh, what we do is to build our party and not to just tear it apart. Uh, I think I can help. I don't want anything. I hope that I can be a healing force in the party. I'm not trying to run for anything. I can assure you I'm not a candidate. You don't have to worry. I've had my time, and I've enjoyed it. People have treated me well. I have uh, had many honors. Now I want to help my party, and I want to help my country, and I believe I can, and I'm going to try to be a, a force for good and for balance and for uh, uh, forward progress for our party without going off the deep end. Well, now, uh, Senator Humphrey, uh, this, uh, this uh, statement of Senator Mondale there a moment ago sounded a little bit like maybe he is running for something. Uh, your statement sounded like he is. What do you think, Senator Mondale, about the makeup of the party now and what should be done in the National Committee? 
Jared. 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 No, no, I ask you something about you, that. Oh, yeah. Come on. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, I have no such plans. Uh, I've just sought the office of the Senate again. The voters of Minnesota were kind enough to send me down here. I have no such plans. I'm just celebrating a, a wonderful victory. Well, wait a minute now. I know he doesn't have any plans, <laughs> and we're not trying to uh, nominate anybody tonight, but there are new leaders in this party. And one of them is right by my side, and he is a leader. He, you, he has an impressive victory here, and I submit that I know him. I know what he can do. I don't know whether he'll be the candidate in 76 or not. I hope he is. I really do, and I'm going to work for it. He has to know that, but I am. But I think that he can do, the, he can do a great job as a national leader. Now, my role is entirely different. My role is what has been in Minnesota for many years, trying to hold a party together, working for our candidates, uh, I'm not trying to be noble. I like to be a good competitor, but uh, this time I want to uh, help somebody else. Senator Humphrey, there are those who would say that what you have on your hands here is a shambles of a party. Particularly, uh, Senator Humphrey, the, the party is uh, facing disaster areas in the South, Midwest, and West. Now, isn't the party going to have to oscillate a little more toward the center, that is, away from the political left side of the spectrum, in order to have any chance at all, even in 1976? Well, first of all, let's keep in mind that we had, uh, despite Mr. Nixon's landslide victory, the Democrats did well in the Congress. We didn't lose any real strength in the Congress, particularly in the Senate. Uh, we kept some governorships. Uh, we picked up legislators. And what we're going to have to do is to get the image of our party uh, back where it belongs, namely that it's a party that's for the working families of this country, that is one that has uh, room for the young and has a definite place for the uh, elected political leadership of the nation. I think we can do it, really. Uh, you say a shambles? No, it's not a shambles. The party's not out here in a shambles. Uh, as a matter of fact, we hope that we might even be able to pull up a governed victory in Minnesota yet tonight. But uh, as I looked around the country, I think there's a lot of strength in the Democratic Party, and there's an amazing Democratic registration. So we'll go ahead and build on that. Any possibility, Senator Humphrey, of getting a man of the stature of, let's say, John Connolly of Texas back uh, in the fold and away from the Nixon wing? Yes, I think so. He says he's a Democrat. I believe in uh, redemption and forgiveness of sin, and uh, uh, I think that John would be willing to forgive me of mine. So we are welcoming everybody back into the Democratic Party that ever left and we want to bring some more in. Senator, also, when you look back over the uh, long campaign, where do you think that Senator McGovern might have uh, stumbled the most? Particularly, I think, of California. You were critical of him over the Democrats, cutting the budget severely. Was this a turning point in the campaign, do you think? Uh, look, I'm the last man you ought to ask about uh, how you stumble. Uh, I've won some, but I've lost some. And the last couple of times uh, in the... Uh, nomination, I lost it. I'm not going to stand in criticism of it. Uh, we'll have plenty of time to work that over and look it over. I'm primarily interested now in putting our party back on good steady ground, keeping our labor movement friends within the party, uh, bringing the coalition of the minorities, the young, the elderly, the women in this party. We were on the right track. Uh, we got, uh, I guess we got some imagery here in 72 that hurt us. But uh, we can win. We can win. I haven't any doubt about that. Senator Mondale? Yes. Uh, this is Roger Mudd. How are you? Hi, Roger. You remember a year or so ago we were talking about uh, the New South, and you said uh, how interested you were in yes. uh, the, yes. the moderating uh, yes. movements in the South. If you've had a, a chance to look at the results tonight, it's not moderate anymore. It's a, a sharp turn to the right. Yes. Spong was defeated as a strong conservative from North Carolina, Jesse Helms conservative from Georgia, Sam Nunn. What do you think the tone is going to be in the Senate? Well, I don't know. At the, at, while this was happening, we also saw the election of some very fine new uh, liberal Democrats elsewhere in the country. And what the uh, basic philosophical direction of the Democratic caucus will be, I don't know. I think it'll be somewhat the same as we've seen it. Uh, I was uh, particularly saddened to see the loss of Senator Spong, who I thought, uh, we disagreed on many things, he's a southerner, but I thought Bill Spong was one of the outstanding uh, legislators in the country. That pr almost broke my heart when the news came through. But, but given, uh, Senator, uh, the, the overwhelming uh, 
vote that the president got, just how much effective opposition can you mount against an administration which has pulled in 65% of the vote? Well, I think uh, when, uh, when they're wrong, I think we've got the votes to stop them in the Senate. The last uh, part of this Senate session, we, we were able to show the president that uh, on these uh, budgetary matters where human issues were involved, human programs were involved, I think we showed a great deal of strength. And I believe in the new Senate, we can do the same. Now, when the president's right, I think we ought to support him. But I think there is a strong Democratic majority in the Senate, and I think we can operate for the best interests of our country. I've just won by an overwhelming vote here in Minnesota. I'm not bragging, but I ran as a liberal Democrat. I didn't hide my record. I ran on a program of social reform, of, uh, of progress in helping human beings, a better health for our old people, to a strong programs to protect the environment. I didn't pull my punches one single bit. And my opponent attacked me as being too liberal. The voters listened to both sides and elected me uh, by an overwhelming margin. I think the people of this country uh, want progress. And I think if the president reads this election as a strong endorsement uh, and a move to the right, I think he's just plain wrong. And I think you'll find that out. Thank you very much, Senator Mondale. Thank you, Senator Humphrey. We're climbing up now toward almost half of the nation's vote counted, and uh, President Nixon has 34 million votes to George McGovern's 14 million votes. That is a slip in the percentage margin that the president has over Senator McGovern. 62% now of the vote uh, has gone to the president, to 37% for Senator McGovern. Uh, it is slipping down toward that 61.1% margin with which uh, President uh, Johnson defeated Senator Goldwater in 1964, which is the highest uh, percentage of any popular vote margin in our history, in our recent history at any rate, the last hundred years and uh, uh, that is a figure that obviously President Nixon would like to beat tonight. But at the moment, uh, he's down to 62%. On the electoral vote, it looks like uh, the second greatest defeat ever handed uh, to a candidate uh, with Nixon 498 electoral votes now and leading for the 10 outstanding votes for 508. McGovern 17 electoral votes. Only those in Massachusetts and in the District of Columbia have gone to uh, Senator McGovern. However, However, he will not go down as the heaviest loser in electoral votes. That honor still goes to Alf Landon of Kansas, defeated by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 36. An interesting thing about these figures tonight, in the early part of the evening, state after state was reporting record voting. However, it turns out that uh, those were overestimates on the part of the secretaries of state around the uh, United States. Uh, it is not going to be a record, it looks like now. Our uh, CBS News estimate, based on the vote counted so far and in our sample precincts, would indicate 74 million votes cast uh, this year. It would take 88 million votes, another 14 million, to establish a, a new record. And this figure, as a matter of fact, with 74 million, is right down about 53.5% of the eligible voters in the United States. That would be the, the lowest percentage uh, since 1948, when in that uh, election year when Harry Truman upset uh, Tom Dewey, 51.5% uh, of the eligible voters actually cast a vote. This is Walter Cronkite at CBS News Election Headquarters. We want to take a look again at our uh, presidential vote. Uh, they tell me that our computer was showing a 10 million vote error at that time. I don't recall what it was, but uh, whatever we said uh, seems to have been wrong. At any rate, we got another 1% of the nation's precincts counted now, and uh, President Nixon has 24,644,000, George McGovern 14,495,000. That percentage remains the same, 62% and 37%. We have a couple of uh, calls out uh, west in the uh, gubernatorial races in Washington. Republican Dan Evans has turned back uh, the governor, former governor Albert Rossellini, uh, who was trying to unseat him, as even Dan Evans had done to him uh, several years ago. But uh, Rossellini failed. The Republicans hold on to the state house in Washington. In uh, the state of Montana, uh, Democrat Thomas Judge has won the governor's race, defeating the Republican Ed Smith. The retiring governor was Democratic, so there's no change in the state of Montana. 
Dan, rather, can you give us a fill-in now on what's been happening in the Middle West? Well, as a matter of fact, Walter, uh, I know that some people may be thinking that tonight's election, once you got past the early hour, has been about as dull as watching grass grow, but some pretty exciting things happening in the Midwest. Uh, first of all, in Minnesota, this is George McGovern's last stand in Minnesota. And in the actual vote count in Minnesota, McGovern actually leads. Uh, well, we just had a change, uh, but this is the CBS News estimate. And our estimate at the moment is that President Nixon uh, has a significant lead in Minnesota and may be carrying the state uh, by as much as 52 percent. Now, Minnesota is uh, the last of in the Midwest. If McGovern doesn't carry Minnesota, that means he's been wiped out completely in the Midwest, not carrying a single state there. In the Missouri governor's race, Missouri has not had a Republican governor since 1940. Christopher Kit Bond was one year old the last time Missouri had a Republican governor. With 63% of the precincts reporting, this is the actual tabulated vote. Bond uh, has a widening lead over Ed Dowd, a former FBI agent uh, and a man uh, who is the father of eight children. Our CBS News estimate uh, is that Bond's final winning total in Missouri, a Republican taking that uh, governor's chair, will be on the order of 56%. In South Dakota, in the Senate race, reverse coattails in South Dakota, and a Senate victory for the Democrats. In that uh, James Aberesk, CBS News estimates he has won the race uh, with a total of about 54% of the vote. Now, George McGovern couldn't carry his home state, but in South Dakota, apparently Democratic uh, candidates have won in the governor's race and in the Senate race. Aberesk uh, is a dove on the war. He has been a congressman. He's pro-amnesty, opposes jets to Israel, and it can only happen in America. He is the son of a man who emigrated to the United States after being a pack peddler in Lebanon, and he is part Indian, American Indian as well. In the Illinois governor's race, and here is a real cliffhanger and part of the story in Illinois and Chicago. Uh, the Illinois race is going to narrow down to possibly the closest race in the country. With 48% of the precincts reporting in Illinois in the gubernatorial race, President Nixon has carried the state, uh, Republican Senator Percy has carried the state, but the Democrat candidate for governor, Daniel Walker, is leading the incumbent Republican, Richard Ogilvy. Here's a question of whether President Nixon's coattails can carry Ogilvy in or not. Now, that's with 48% of the uh, vote uh, in and tabulated, 48% of the precincts reporting anyway, but the CBS News estimate in that Illinois uh, gubernatorial race is that it's simply too close for us to make any, uh, even a guess at this stage. Now, here's what's happening. The Daily Machine in Chicago is in serious trouble. For one thing, uh, although Chicago, by a very slight margin apparently, went Democratic, we're talking about the city itself, Cook County in uh, Illinois, with 50% of the uh, vote, went for President Nixon. And Mayor Daley's ward simply have not, up to this point, delivered for him. And in the all-important race for the state's attorney in Cook County, it's a tight race between Edward Hanrahan, the incumbent, and the so-called protector of the Daily Machine, in that he has the strings on what is investigated and what is prosecuted and what isn't. Hanrahan, at our last report, was trailing the Republican, Bernard Carey, in that all-important race uh, for state's attorney in Cook County. Now, the Daily people were very quick to say, all during the campaign, that in this hanrahan Carey race, it was a matter of survival of the machine. It was life or death for the machine. If Hanrahan left, that the Daily Machine might well be through in Illinois. Now, we're not prepared to say as yet that Hanrahan has lost the race, but it's very, very tight, and Hanrahan is trailing. So this could be uh, very hot in Chicago and Illinois. It looks like, uh, Walter, it might go very well right down to the wire in both the governor's race and the Hanrahan race. Now, in Iowa, incumbent Republican Governor Robert Ray has won with 55% of the vote. In North Dakota, the race for governor is too close to call between Republican Richard Larson and Democrat Arthur Link. And for whatever it may be worth, Walter, you recall we told you once, I think, that a man running for Congress in Missouri was running on the slogan, it's fourth down and goal to go America. Well, if so, they couldn't get it into the end zone. Russell Sloan, who was campaigning on that slogan and hoping to come in on President Nixon's coattails, didn't make it. Fourth down and goal to go, he lost to Jerry Litton. I started to report a little while ago uh, and got cut off with something happening, something uh, unimportant like a couple of states falling to uh, President Nixon, something like that. But John Conley, uh, who headed Democrats for uh, Nixon, you know, uh, uh, said a little while ago down in Houston, Texas, that uh, President Nixon offered him a job in the new administration. I hope I have the good sense to turn it down. 
He said that all he really wants to do is to continue in private law practice in uh, Houston and that uh, he's not cutting off a future in politics, but that's his present intention. Walter, I would guess that President Nixon offered John Connolly the job of Secretary of State that uh, John Connolly would take his arm off. <laughs> the Senate races tonight have been uh, very interesting uh, across the board, and I'm going to tell you about them in just one second after I tell you that the popular vote count has now gone over the halfway mark. We now have 51 percent of the nation's precincts counted, and uh, President Nixon is retaining his 62 to 37 percent lead over Senator McGovern. The count 25 million 184,000 for President Nixon, 14 million 837,000 about for uh, Senator uh, McGovern. In the Senate, uh, it's been very interesting tonight. The Republicans have lost four seats. Uh, the Democrats have lost four to the Republicans. So it's a push so far. There are three races outstanding, which are quite interesting. They're very close in Delaware, Colorado, and Montana. I'm going to call on Mike Wallace to tell about us about that close Delaware race, and then we'll go to John Hart for the two Western races in Colorado and Montana. Mike? Well, to take a look at that uh, board that shows the Delaware race, 93% of precincts in Delaware are now reporting, and Senator Caleb Boggs has 107,492 votes. 29-year-old Joseph Biden has 107,599 votes. In other words, Biden is just a little bit ahead in Delaware. As I said earlier, he's the new Castle County Councilman. He'll be 30 years old, old enough to get into the Senate should he, uh, should he win on November the 20th. And he's run an extraordinary campaign from 38 points down in August. He's come all the way up to be neck and neck with Senator Caleb Boggs. In a sense, it's the script of the candidate all over again. Boggs, a man who said that he could do everything that had to be done for Delaware. Biden, the young fellow who wanted to talk about ecology and taxes and one thing and another. And there they are, neck and neck. And I guess it's not going to be decided, who knows, a half an hour, an hour, two hours, Walter. Maybe, uh, maybe not till the recount. It's that close at the end. John Hart, how about your two Senate races? Surprise for the Republicans in Colorado, Walter. Uh, they had expected uh, Republican Senator Gordon Llewellyn Allott to win uh, by eight or ten points. At least that's what the polls showed. But uh, Democratic lawyer from Denver, Floyd Haskell, who was a Republican until two years ago and left the Republican Party, differing with President Nixon on the invasion of Cambodia and the nomination of Harold Carswell, has surprisingly been leading Senator Allott throughout the evening, anywhere from two to six to 7,000 uh, votes. And it fluctuates back and forth, but it's far too close to call yet. But it is a surprise that they are that close and that Floyd Haskell is leading. Uh, before we move on to Montana, the other pending race, we want to mention that the Idaho Senate race has <clears throat> been won by the Republicans. The Republican seat left by Len Jordan, who retired, won by Congressman James McClure, a three-term conservative congressman, uh, winning over uh, William Bud Davis, who was president of Idaho State College and who said upon resigning in order to run, only a man who was out of his gourd would give up his job as university president. He may be saying that again tonight. In Montana, we haven't mentioned this this evening, uh, Senator Lee Metcalf, uh, wanting to return to the Senate. He is a, a liberal Democrat, one of the founders of the ADA, running against uh, Henry Hibbard. Uh, he seems to be fairly uh, comfortable with only 19% of the vote in, but uh, we can't tell exactly at this point uh, what's going to happen in that race, although Metcalf has a comfortable lead. In the Montana governor's race, it was won by Lieutenant Governor Thomas Judge. Lieutenant Governor DeForest Anderson, who retired this year, winning over uh, Edward Big Ed Smith, a six foot five rancher from Dagmar, who dropped out of school in the eighth grade to become a big time rancher of sheep, cattle, hogs, and grain. The interesting thing in this race, Walter, is that uh, one of the big arguments was a two to six million dollar surplus in the state treasury in Montana. The Republicans accusing the Democrats of. Uh, too much of a surcharge by taxes and the uh, Democrats saying, well, no, that's because we were so efficient. 
It's interesting where a state has a surplus to argue about instead of yeah. the other way around. Right. Taxes have brought down a lot of governors tonight. And then the, uh, from Saigon, we have uh, the first reaction to the South Vietnamese government to President Nixon's uh, re-election. It said that it uh, showed the American people voted according to common sense for peace with honor. It, uh, with regard to the continuity of American policy in Vietnam and the restoration of a just peace, we are very pleased to share the wise choice of the American people. The statement of Foreign Minister Tran Van Lam. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. Texas, Houston to be exact, a new uh, district there, has elected the first uh, black woman to Congress ever elected to, to Congress from the South. She is Barbara Jordan, and in Houston, Jed Duvall is with her now. Jed? Thank you, Walter. Uh, Ms. Jordan, as you heard Walter explain, of course, you're the first black woman elected to Congress from the South. Right. Uh, does this frighten you a bit, being this much a part of history? Well, it really doesn't uh, frighten me, because I've been a part of history before. The first black woman elected to the Texas State Senate and uh, served in that body. And I just think that uh, being a part of history uh, provides a challenging opportunity which otherwise would not be provided. Now, this was a new district that you were elected from. Did you get help from the Texas White Establishment in creating that district? Did you have a hand in well, that? Well, in drafting the bill which created this new legislative district, it had to be passed by the Texas State Senate, by the House of Representatives, signed by the Speaker of the House, the Lieutenant Governor, and the Governor. Now, if that constitutes white establishment help, I needed the cooperation of all of those bodies, the interworkings of that structure, to create the district, and I did have their help. But look ahead now. You go off to Congress, and uh, as a result of what you've seen tonight, the tremendous mandate given the Nixon administration, what do you look forward to? Well, I uh, think the Congress will reassert its independence as the legislative branch of government providing a check and a balance to the actions of the executive. Mr. Nixon did receive a mandate, but the United States Congress is going to be democratically controlled, and I think that Congress will provide the proper kind of balance and weight to the kinds of decisions which Mr. Nixon would make. Thank you very much. The first okay. woman elected, the first black woman elected to the Congress from the South. Barbara Jordan of Houston. We might note uh, that Shirley Chisholm, uh, who was uh, the first black uh, placed before a convention for nomination, who ran uh, uh, as a candidate for the Democratic nomination, has uh, won uh, uh, re-election in her New York district by a large margin, 87%. Uh, Von Braithwaite Burke, who won uh, great prominence uh, as the uh, as uh, one of the uh, chairpersons at the Democratic National Convention, uh, running from the Watts District in Los Angeles, we have no returns as yet on that race. For some thoughts on oh one thing, we just had a call for the CBS News estimate uh, at any rate uh, from the state of Montana, uh, indicating that uh, Democrat Lee Metcalf has uh, won uh, re-election there. When the, all the votes are counted, uh, we believe the total will be around 54% of the vote uh, to his opposition, 46%. Now for some thoughts on President Nixon's new mandate. Let's go back to Eric Severi. Well, we heard a good deal from Hubert Humphrey a little while ago about the necessity to heal the wounds of the Democratic Party and their future. But what's really more important, of course, is where the re-elected president will take the government and take us all in the next four years. He's now stronger than his own party, of course. Doesn't have the Senate or the House, but he's got some ideological change in the Senate that may help him to a degree. There will be new appointments. He may have one or two uh, Supreme Court judges to appoint in the next four years. There will be some cabinet changes, obviously, we've been much discussed. Mr. Agnew seems very well positioned as of now for the run four years from now. The John Connolly future in that direction doesn't look particularly rosy, I wouldn't think. I don't know what Teddy thinks about that, but uh, uh, I would think one thing, Teddy, that the President do a lot of traveling next uh, year or so, wouldn't you? He loves that, and there are things to do in Europe, particularly. I think he regards this as <clears throat> foreign policy has always been that thing which interested him most. 
He's just taken what he considers are the first steps in foreign policy. There are dreams he talks about of a great European summit conference to finally settle World War II in Europe. The peace in the Middle East is unfinished, and I know that lies on his mind. There uh, are, 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 I believe he considers his foreign policy only in the outline stage, and so much more has to be done. Uh, I, I think, though, he's, uh, much of this is going to be governed by the whole problem of the budget, taxes, inflation. Uh, the budget's essentially out of control. Uh, even if you added no more big programs, you're going to uh, probably have to raise taxes. The inflation still worries them a great deal. I would think on domestic things, there's going to be a hold down, a slow down all around, wouldn't you? Uh, well, I think so. I think also there's going to be a new shape to that thing as he reshuffles his cabinet. We all know that Secretary Laird is leaving. I believe Secretary Rogers is leaving. There's even the possibility that... Uh, the Attorney General may be replaced. There are several others who may be replaced. I'll, I believe that his relations with Congress will depend to a great extent upon how he reshuffles that cabinet. There are names that are being talked about in Washington, the possible elevation of Secretary Richardson to a higher post, possibility that uh, Governor Rockefeller may be sent down to, or may be summoned to Washington. I think with a sharper outline to his domestic policy, with a new cabinet, he can turn to the Congress and perhaps have more success on his domestic program. Teddy, wouldn't you agree that um, he must, as a very early order of business, clear the slates of this whole Watergate mess, mess and everything connected with it, either have these people exonerated or get them out and persuade the country that the taint is gone, if there is a real taint there. Oh, oh, I think that the shadow on his victory is the Watergate affair, and I believe that a great many people very close to the president would like to have him move on that as one of the high priorities of his new administration. Uh, there can be no doubt that that's a priority. I'm talking to Teddy White, who's been traveling with the president's party just the last few days. There'll be uh, much more to say about all this, of course, later and uh, the days to come. I don't know if Walter has uh, attention, but uh, I always seem to catch you, Walter, in the middle of a gourmet meal. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> well, Eric, it's about the only chance I have to uh, uh, spray the troubled throat. <laughs> Take the uh, little bit of, uh, of uh, soft, uh, soft drink, soda pop or something to uh, keep going. The... It, uh, however, looks like one of our earliest election nights, I must say, uh, in, I, I can't remember one in these last uh, 20 years, uh, that uh, which we're likely to be leaving here quite so early as tonight. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. In the Montana Senate race, Senator Lee Metcalf has won over Henry Hibbert, a two-term state representative. He ran supporting Nixon on the war. Metcalf um, may have gotten some help from grousing in the state over the Russian wheat deal, in a wheat growing state. He was anti war, pro amnesty all the way. In Washington, we haven't announced the um, governor's race there, which was won by Daniel Evans. And this is something of a surprise because uh, he was being crowded very hard by Albert Rossellini. Who, uh, whom he denied a third term eight years ago and who tried to deny him a third term this time and didn't do it. And we want to remind you that the Republicans did pick up a Senate seat in New Mexico. Uh, Pete Domenici running as a Nixon Republican against Jack Daniel. Waller? Actually, uh, in all of the 33 Senate races, neither the Republicans nor the Democrats made a net gain, at least not up to uh, this hour. The Republicans uh, took four seats from the Democrats, and the Democrats four seats from the Republicans. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue after this pause for station identification. This is CBS. CBS News coverage of Election 72 with the final returns and election night wrap-up. Reporting from CBS News Election Headquarters in New York, here is correspondent Walter Cronkite. 
a smashing landslide for President Nixon uh, yesterday in the nation's 1972 election. The man who uh, barely lost the presidency in 1960, barely won it in 68, uh, piled up a majority that may very well go down in history as the greatest in our history. At this moment, 56% of the vote uh, has been counted, and the president leads with 62% of the vote to McGovern's 37% of the vote. The figure is 27 million 341,000 for Richard Nixon, 16 million 158,000 for uh, Governor, uh, Senator uh, McGovern. Uh, that uh, gave Nixon that sweep uh, all of the states except Massachusetts and uh, the District of Columbia. A total of 17 electoral votes uh, for McGovern, 498 electoral votes uh, already counted for President Nixon, and it appears that he will get uh, the rest of them, that McGovern will come out with just 17 electoral votes. Uh, also, the House and the Senate. There, the coattail effect did not work this time. President Nixon's victory was a personal victory and not a party victory, apparently. Uh, this, the Republicans needed to win a net gain of only five seats to win control of the Senate. Uh, they are failing to do that uh, tonight, and the Senate will be firmly in Democratic hands again. Uh, they, they, the Republicans have elected 16 senators, the Democrats 14 senators. There are three outstanding uh, seats as yet that uh, have not been determined, but under no circumstances can the Republicans win control. The House, the Republicans have won 132 seats, the Democrats 188 seats. Our VPA figures, our vote profile analysis of selected precincts around the country, indicates to us that the Democrats will end up with 245 seats, the Republicans 190. That would mean a net loss of 11 seats to the Democrats, but uh, they hold a majority of 39 now. They would hold thus a majority of 28 in the new House of Representatives meeting in January. Uh, that figure for the estimate is give or take eight seats, not enough, obviously, to affect uh, the total outcome and the makeup of the new House of Representatives. In the Congress, uh, in the uh, uh, gubernatorial races for the state houses, there were 18 uh, House uh, uh, state houses up for this time. The Democrats uh, had uh, 20, uh, seat, 20 state uh, governments before, uh, the governorships, that is. The Democrats had 30. The Republicans have won uh, six of the 18 uh, races up. The Democrats have won eight. Four are still outstanding. In that case, it is also a push so far. The Democrats have taken two governorships from the Republicans, and the Republicans have taken two governorships from the Democrats. No coattail effect uh, in the major races for the control of the Congress or the control of the uh, state uh, governorships. Uh, whether the coattail effect uh, may be seen in some uh, lower uh, state races uh, or local races, that will remain to be seen when those total votes are in, in another Another day or two. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. Let's get a little wrap up of the Midwest now from you, Dan Rather. For all of you can color all of the Midwest uh, Republican in terms of the presidential race, with the exception of Minnesota. Senator McGovern and President Nixon running as close as fingers in that state. Uh, President Nixon seems to have a, a lead on the basis of our CBS News estimates, but the race is by no means decided, and it may be a while before we know about Minnesota. Otherwise, uh, in the Midwest, really only two races uh, of any national interest to be decided as yet, and one of them may be of considerable national interest, and that is the gubernatorial race in the state of Illinois. Democrat Daniel Walker, most of the evening, has been clinging to a lead over the incumbent Republican Richard Ogilvy. It's been uh, about a 100,000 vote lead for the last several hours. This is the actual vote in intabulated, 55% of the Illinois precincts in intabulated. Now, Walker's lead is mostly on the basis of what he got out of Chicago and Cook County. He got a, a fairly good-sized lead out of the Chicago and Cook County area, where 50% of the vote is, but nothing like the old uh, Dick Daly machine uh, leads that Democratic candidates normally come out of there with. But it's a weird situation in that Ogilvy, who instituted Illinois' first uh, income tax, is not doing nearly as well in downstate Illinois, in the Corn Belt area and Springfield, uh, which normally rolls up enormous Republican margins. And on any other occasion, you might say that Walker, even with his uh, lead, 
would uh, probably lose it as the morning goes along, but that's by no means certain. And this is a very important race in that whether Ogilvy, the incumbent Republican, wins or Walker, the Democratic challenger, whichever man uh, wins it, he's going to be a big factor and one of the kings in the political chess game of his party for the future. Now, the other story in the Midwest is that there is uh, a barn burner in the city of Chicago. The Dick Daly machine is fighting for survival, and it's the hottest time in that town since uh, Mrs. O'Leary's cow perhaps kicked over a lantern and started to fire some note, in that the Daly machine, their whole game uh, in this election was to try to pull out the state's attorney in Cook County. Edward Hanrahan, the Daly man, and a man who saw himself as possibly the successor to Mayor Richard Daly in uh, Chicago, with all that implies, trailing uh, Bernard Carey, a former FBI man, by a substantial margin with most of the votes in. And Walter, it's uh, reports of the death of the Daily Machine may be premature, but it is a possibility. For some final thoughts on this election night, back to Eric Severide. Well, Walter, I've uh, <clears throat> about run out of uh, final and semi-final thoughts, but um, I've got with me uh, a very distinguished, very sophisticated European who knows this country exceedingly well. And I thought it'd be uh, nice to hear from somebody from a different point of view than the rest of us who are here in the middle of the bear pit. And that's Luigi Barzini, a very distinguished Italian journalist and author and parliamentarian, now up at Harvard, and an old friend of CBS News and of mine. Luigi, uh, the European, how does, is this an important election for Europe? Well, it's very strange to talk to you so early in the night, Eric. I usually talk about 4 o'clock waiting for the returns from Texas. But, of course, it is a very important election for the Europeans, so much so that I think we should be allowed to vote, uh, perhaps. I think uh, a good idea. Someday. Uh, of course, foreign affairs was not an issue. It was not debated. There were just a few speeches dedicated to some aspects of foreign yeah. affairs. The only foreign affair that was really touched upon was more of an internal affair. It was the Vietnam War. But though, although the foreign affairs was not debated, the consequences of an American presidential election in the foreign field are tremendous. Uh, I think uh, President Nixon has ahead of him some of the greatest problems he ever tackled outside Vietnam, of course. With Europe, you mean? Well, Japan, Japan yeah. India, Bangladesh, and Europe. I think it's about time America recognized that Europe has come of age, is rich enough to support its own armies, well, bring that's what, the boys back home. That's what McGovern was trying to say, wasn't he? Well, uh, McGovern and Nixon said more or less the same things it was the modalities of application that changed. Don't you think we'll have to see President Nixon going to Europe quite a bit now? Or that there'll be a security he, conference sometime? I think he announced it. Uh, that what I read in yeah, the papers. He's going to visit European capitals. Is he popular in Europe? As a person? Well, I can't say he's popular. A foreign president cannot be popular. But he's understood. I mean, the job he's done, which is... Uh, rigging up a complicated Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, Moscow needed wheat. Uh, yeah. Peking needed American assistance to defend itself, to defend China against the Soviets. And uh, the Americans had the wheat, had the technical capacity to give to China, but they also needed something, which was a hand at Vietnam, a good advice in Hanoi. And this kind of practical power dealing, you think, is appreciated in, in Europe? Well, yes, because the Europeans have been uh, always a little wary of the American statesmen who announced noble ideas, yeah. which everybody shares, without uh, the necessary uh, machinery behind them. We get the I point. Can so I think Kissinger would be appreciated there, too, uh, yes. no doubt. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi Barzini, Italian journalist and old friend of ours, taking a look at this election. Walter? I have to personally uh, thank Luigi, an old friend, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Luigi. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. Uh, one more state has fallen to President Nixon, as expected, Arizona. Uh, 
uh, on, on a basis of our CBS News estimate, uh, will go for him 63 percent when all of the vote uh, is counted. And that only uh, leaves uh, Alaska and Hawaii to be heard from, along with Minnesota, where it uh, is very close uh, at this moment, but uh, leaning toward uh, the Nixon side. Uh, and looks like it may be uh, Nixon by perhaps 52, 48 percent in Minnesota. But that's only leaning that way. We can't uh, call it the, as yet. Well, gentlemen, we've uh, seen a historic landslide here tonight. And each of you have had uh, report uh, that uh, some of the anomalies in uh, your areas uh, in this landslide. I wonder what has impressed you most about uh, the way it all developed tonight. Uh, Mike, maybe we can start with you. The posters were right, and there were some doubters for a while this morning, as a matter of fact. And if I may report just one thing from my friend over at Yankelovich, Yankelovich Poe, which did its work for the New York Times and Time Magazine. The poster says that she was also impressed with the fact that we found that 73% of the registered voters say they are sick and tired of hearing people attack patriotism, morality, and other traditional American values. And among Nixon voters, the figure is even higher, 81%. And I think myself that that had a good deal to do with the fact that Nixon took the East today, and that probably is part of the reason that it didn't rub off in the way of coattails. Who, who do they? Who do they think? Did, did she say, Mike, uh, uh, attacks patriotism and morality? I don't know of anybody attacking these two. constants, I always thought. I haven't. Uh, I don't have the question here in front of me. Sick and tired of hearing people attack patriotism, morality, and other traditional American values. What I imagine it means is uh, that in the, in the perception of millions of American people, uh, that's what was being done at the uh, Democratic Convention. And I'm sure that they perceive McGovern and McGovern supporters as doing that down through the month since. This is a, an assertion that, uh, that to be against the Vietnam War and the president's position on it is an attack on patriotism. Uh, well, uh, to, uh, well, I, I should get the specific uh, the question that was asked, Walter, but this is uh, from the lady at Yankelovich. That, that's the, uh, that's the, the triple-A charge that the Republicans laid against uh, the McGovern people, uh, amnesty, abortion, and acid. Right. I think that's, some, I think that's what they're getting at. Uh, what, what uh, uh, Roger, what about the solid South now? Solidly Republican this year. Uh, it did bring in some Republican senators and Republican governors for the first time since Reconstruction. But do you think that this portends a, uh, a, a period of Republican domination in the South? Well, until we can find out just how the, the party did below the federal level, below uh, Congress and gubernatorial and Senate, it's, it's hard to make a conclusion. The, the, the interesting thing and the thing that we all overlook because we don't handle such figures on an election night is the changing nature of the population in the South. This massive uh, infusion of uh, industry has brought uh, people into the South uh, who were not born there. And uh, so the values are changing. The suburbs in the South are growing. Income is rising. Uh, the standard of living is going up. And this has uh, increased the re Republican registration. It has uh, caused people to break away because uh, from their old democratic traditions because they have not lived in the South before. And now you have, uh, if you just take a look at the, at the Southern Senate list, you'll see, beginning with Virginia, a Republican senator, North Carolina, a Republican senator, South Carolina, a Republican senator, Florida already has one, uh, Tennessee has two, Kentucky has one. Uh, governors are spread through the South now, Republicans. Uh, already in Virginia, Tennessee, and now you add, uh, what can we add now, North Carolina? You may add Texas. The most striking thing to me in the South was the way, I've never seen it before, because you've never had a Democratic nominee like McGovern, but in the South, to see loyal Democrats who have been in the party their whole lifetime 
one after the other saying, I'm not having anything to do with that campaign. I'm running my own campaign. John Sparkman, the, the running mate for Adlai Stevenson, a national Democrat, just cutting loose altogether from George McGovern, just getting as far away as they can. When the Democrat was a conservative, it worked in Sparkman's case and Sam Nunn's case in Georgia. But if a Democrat was a moderate, like Galifianakis or Spong, he couldn't cut himself loose from McGovern altogether. They were able to tie him in. I, I suppose this is the culmination, really, of the, of the whole slide for the Democrats in the South ever since 1948, when, uh, when uh, Hubert Humphrey and some other young Turk liberals at the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia pushed through a civil rights plank forced uh, the South to form a, uh, a breakaway party. And ever since then, uh, the slide has been downhill for the Democrats in the South. Well, that 48 uh, presidential race uh, enabled the South uh, to vote for a party other than the Democratic Party. The word in Minnesota was that while Walter Mondale, the Democratic senator who won re-election tonight, and Hubert Humphrey worked for George McGovern in Minnesota, that they didn't actually work all that hard. Uh, it may well be that uh, what we're in the middle of here is what the political scientists and the sociologists call a great transitional change. But I think in the Midwest at least, and it may be true all over the country, that we've seen tonight a counter-revolution of the American middle. They are rejecting uh, what they see as the bankrupt liberalism of the 1960s. Uh, they wanted the middle road candidate. They see President Nixon as representing both a return to normalcy and change. With George McGovern, they saw what they perceived to be radical change. Now, the danger for the Democratic Party, looking at these Midwest returns, is that for the first time in a long while, the guys in the back of the shop, union card-carrying members, blue-collar guys, said no to their union bosses, uh, didn't vote that way. They were sophisticated enough to split their ticket. A lot of people in Chicago who for years had gone in and pulled the lever for Democrats and Democrats only split their ticket. Mayor Daley, uh, in deep trouble, if not uh, fatally wounded politically, uh, at least critically wounded. Uh, it's, it's a shift to the middle. That's what people are demanding. Uh, one note, I know you want to move on. Uh, Michigan is voting two to one against liberalizing abortion laws. California is voting uh, to restore the death penalty also. But that's in John Hart's department. John, uh, what about your thoughts uh, what's happened out in the West tonight? Well, the pollsters there were conservative, as I think they were generally nationwide, as you indicated, Mike. Uh, Urban Field pulled up uh, until the weekend before the election and found a 14-point separation holding. Um, we indicate uh, on the CBS estimate it's going to be far more than that, 23 percent. The Democrats and the Republicans both did a lot of canvassing in California, Walter, and uh, they went after the Democratic vote. That is, uh, the Republicans went after the Democrats who uh, indicated interest in Nixon, and the Democrats went after the same voters. And an interesting thing, uh, the Republicans put on a big effort to get out those Democratic for Nixon votes. The Democrats did not make any effort to differentiate. Uh, it was sort of an idealistic thing. Well, if we've done our job right, we'll win, and, and, if, we, and if we don't, we didn't. I think in the, in the final uh, uh, word that you have to say, out of all the things that happened in the campaign, the handling of the uh, Eagleton case hurt George McGovern most among that large block of new voters in California. It may have been that uh, he lost the election the day that uh, the Eagleton announcement came out. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. On a battlefield or a chessboard or a political arena, the winning strategy always has been to control the center. Richard Nixon not only controlled the political center that he carved out four years ago, but he enlarged on it. He totally dominated it in this election. The steamroller victory was the result of many factors, a well-financed, smoothly organized campaign, a deft handling of a spate of volatile issues, an emphasis on the office rather than the man running, and a Democratic challenger who alienated many of his party's traditional supporters, uh, failed to produce the new coalition that he sought, 
and uh, stumbled through a series of campaign embarrassments, including, as John Hart noted a minute ago, changing running mates almost before the campaign began. The Democrats also bet on a big turnout to carry them to victory, and it didn't occur. It seems like it was a rather small turnout by percentage tonight, uh, whether because of voter apathy or voter protest against both major candidates. We won't know until we get some post-polling done. However, while it was a Nixon landslide, it was far from a Republican one. Mr. Nixon rolled up uh, those huge margins in many states, but the Republicans were unable to win either the Senate or the House tonight, with Mr. Nixon likely turning more attention to domestic affairs in his next term, a new drive to capture the Congress uh, surely will be high on his list and uh, on any list of presidential priorities. And what of George McGovern and the Democrats? Well, he'll continue as a senator, but perhaps not again be a presidential nominee. His party will regroup. Maybe it'll shift to the right. We'll have to wait and see. But it, too, will survive and fight again. As a matter of fact, it's in better shape tonight uh, than the Republicans were after Goldwater's uh, defeat in 1964. At least it controls the Congress, which the Republicans did not at that time. Tonight, however, belongs to the president, who in his third try for the nation's highest office now has scored his greatest triumph. A 1972 campaign slogan has become a fact. Uh, he's going to have four more years in the White House for Richard Milhouse Nixon. I'd like to thank everybody uh, here at CBS who uh, put this election night report on the air, despite some difficulties that we did have. It was a valiant service by all concerned, <clears throat> particularly tonight. I'd like to mention our executive producer, Bob Wessler. He's been putting together these election nights for some seven uh, elections. It's a whale of a tough job. Uh, he's done it with uh, uh, great uh, taste and great dispatch, and this is uh, going to be his last election. He's leaving us for bigger and greater things at CBS. So to Bob Wessler, from all of us, a thank you, and a good night to him and to all of you. A good night from all of the CBS News election staff. This is Walter Cronkite reporting from CBS News election headquarters uh, in New York. This has been CBS News coverage of Elections 72.